Uh, this is our crew patch, and uh, here's the patch on the cake they make us uh, traditionally at our uh, last meal on Earth before we go uh, into space. We usually get cranked up about three hours prior. We had a really relaxed schedule this flow. Uh, we woke up about 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, and uh, we're going to launch at 9.48 at night. The first picture was of me in the suit-up room. Here's our pilot, Joe Edwards. Payload commander, Bonnie Dunbar, who also served as uh, mission specialist number three. Jim Riley, uh, mission specialist number one. Mike Anderson, MS number two. Andy Thomas, our long duration crew member. Uh, Salazan Sharipov, our Russian cosmonaut who served as uh, one of our mission specialists. Here's the walk out to the orbiter. Again, we uh, walk out and get strapped into the vehicle about three hours prior. And these last days. Yeah, last this is what on greets us on our way out to the pad. At the top of the vehicle. Assembly building, that's the largest concrete building in the world. I've been in that building. Is this the first time they let a camera on top of that building, John? Yeah, it, no, other than a NASA fixed position camera, Larry, we got uh, very special access. I don't know if you can see the shuttle over my shoulder, but we are above the shuttle. I don't think viewers have ever been able to see a shuttle launch where the camera was higher in the air than the shuttle is, but that's, uh, that's the, uh, the position we are in tonight, and we're going to be able to launch, watch this launch from uh, a position uh, just about three miles from the launch pad, but uh, the shuttle, we are told, uh, will light up the entire Atlantic Ocean on the east coast of the United States. And what our viewers should be able to see, if people who have been here before are telling us the truth, is the entire Atlantic Ocean, uh, left and right of your screen, will turn bright red or yellow as it reflects the, uh, the blast of the launch. Let's listen to the final seconds of the countdown together. Start, four, three, two, one. We have booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavor, continuing the union of U.S. and Russian space endeavors. Booster Endeavor roll program. Roger, roll Endeavor. Houston is now controlling. The roll maneuver is complete. Endeavor is now in a heads down, wings level position, headed to a rendezvous with the Mir space station. seconds into flight. Endeavour now traveling at about 520 miles per hour. Endeavour's engines are now throttling down to 67% of rated thrust. Endeavour is now passing through the area of maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle in the lower atmosphere. Downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 2.3 miles, traveling at a speed of just about 870 miles per hour. Houston, go at throttle up. Roger, go with throttle up. One minute, 19 seconds into the flight. Endeavour's three liquid-fueled engines are now back at full throttle, 104% of rated thrust. Endeavour downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, a distance of about 10 and a half miles, traveling at the speed of about 2,000 miles per hour. Just about seven minutes of powered flight remaining. from our position here on the ground and uh, I mean it is many miles uh, away from us now if, if uh, Larry if your viewers on the East Coast want to step outside the southeastern United States you can probably see this thing much brighter than the brightest star in the sky tonight it uh, that launch was overwhelming to me I, I've oh, never me too. The it was, I mean uh, the, the, the vantage point boosters. that we got of the whole ocean oh, uh, yeah. lighting up and this is a pretty important mission to NASA it is the next to the last time they're going to go up to the Russian space station. They're going to drop off astronaut Andy Thomas for the, to be the last American astronaut on Mir, and astronaut Dave Wolf, who's been up there for the past uh, four and a half months, is going to get to come home to his family and friends. 
But looks like a beautiful launch. Looks like the uh, shuttle is well on its way to going into orbit uh, around the Earth. Uh, it'll be in orbit in uh, just a couple more minutes, Larry. Thanks. Great job, John. Isn't that exciting? I think that may have been the most exciting shot I've seen with the leaving at night. Uh, Evan Thomas, where is this tomorrow morning in the newspaper? The shuttle launch? This incredible, they're going to switch places in space. Uh, will it be bigger than the sex scandal? Is that what you're asking? Should is it be bigger than the sex scandal? <laughs> no, no. The sex scandal it should not be bigger. bigger than the sex scandal. The sex scandal is still bigger news. Although it is interesting to feel the air go out of it a little bit today. And, uh, <laughs> the media beast likes to be fed and uh, likes a big raw steak, and it really didn't get that today. It didn't get the revelations that keep it going. You can feel a sort of a deflating effect. We'll just have to see what happens tomorrow. David, watching that, I mean, it handles as we are, little people on this planet. It don't, it don't matter much, does it? Fantastic shots. I kept yeah. on thinking John Holland was going to be blown off the top of that building. I know. <laughs> but, but it doesn't put away, it's, it's, it's a story, but not the big story. Absolutely not. I, 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 uh, I do think, Larry, though, that this thing probably will deflate and inflate again. You do? Yes, I do. Marlon, do you think so, too? Yes, I think it has to inflate again, uh, especially on the legal side. I mean, that's the big shoe that hasn't dropped yet. US Raumfähre Endeavour is in the night planmäßig gestartet. Ihr Ziel, die russische Raumstation Mir. Ihr Rendezvous soll fünf Tage dauern. An Bord der Endeavour ist Andy Thomas. Er ist der letzte Amerikaner, der auf der Mir bleiben wird. Ende Mai soll dann auch er zur Erde zurückkehren. Die russische Raumfähre Endeavour ist in der Nacht vom US Raumfahrtzentrum Cape Canaveral zur russischen Raumstation Mir gestartet. An Bord sind sieben Astronauten. Unter ihnen der Raumfahrer Thomas, der den Amerikaner Wolf ablösen soll. Wolf ist seit September zusammen mit zwei russischen Kosmonauten in der Mir. In zwei Tagen wird die Endeavour an der Raumstation andocken und fünf Tage lang angekoppelt bleiben. In dieser Zeit will die Besatzung unter anderem Experimente für das deutsche Raumfahrtzentrum machen. Außerdem bringt die Endeavour rund zwei Tonnen Ausrüstungs- und Versorgungsgüter zur Raumstation. Ihre Endeavour ist erfolgreich in Cape Canaveral im US-Bundesstaat Florida gestartet. Zum letzten Mal bringt die Endeavour amerikanische Astronauten zur Raumstation Mir. Mit der Rückkehr des Astronauten Andrew Thomas im Juni endet die russisch-amerikanische Zusammenarbeit auf der Mir. Die drei veränderten Haupttriebwerke der Endeavour funktionierten beim Start reibungslos. Die Raumfähre wird morgen an die Mir andocken. Sie bringt unter anderem eine Klimaanlage und einen neuen Computer zur Mir. Die sieben Astronauten werden gemeinsam mit ihren russischen Kollegen wissenschaftliche Experimente durchführen. Ende Jänner wird die Endeavour wieder in Cape Canaveral landen. The US Space Shuttle Endeavour is heading toward the Mir. Start, four, three, two, one. We have booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavour, continuing the Union... Endeavour lifted off Thursday night from Florida's Kennedy Space Center. It is scheduled to link up with the Russian space station on Saturday. The shuttle will be dropping off some supplies, including an air conditioner and a backup computer. In addition, astronaut Andrew Thomas will swap places with colleague David Wolf, who's been living aboard Mir since the end of September. Uh, the main engines light about 6.6 uh, .6 seconds prior to liftoff. The computers check them out. If uh, they're all okay, then the solids are given the command to fire. That was the twang. The whole ascent takes about eight and a half minutes, and the first two minutes you get most of your thrust out of the two side rocket boosters that you can see so clearly there. Uh, the vehicle shakes quite a bit under the solids. And uh, together, the three main engines and the two solids put out uh, around seven million pounds of thrust. The vehicle itself weighs about four and a half million pounds when we leave the pad. Now, here's a good picture of the uh, sod rockets coming off the uh, orbiter. And again, once that happens, then you've got about six more minutes uh, before you get to orbit. This is a view inside the cockpit. Uh, all the shaking, the main engine's just lit. Again, about six seconds prior to liftoff. Then the big flash from the uh, sod rocket plume and uh, a little more severe shaking comes from the sod rockets. If you look carefully out our windows, you'll see a cloud layer that we went through. Here come the clouds. And again, the flash was from the uh, reflection off of our own rocket plume. Then one more flash, this is a real attention getter when the sod rockets come off and uh, a lot of debris goes past the Ford windows. 
for the next six and a half minutes, we ride on the main engines, and that's when we get most of our orbital velocity. Uh, once we get in space, we open up the payload bay doors. Uh, we start turning our rocket ship into a, a laboratory. This exposes the payload bay to the vacuum of space and also lets us glimpse uh, Earth out the back windows of the orbiter. Back in the payload bay, you can see the space laboratory in the back, and uh, there are several experiments in the payload bay. We had 23 science and technology experiments distributed throughout the shuttle, uh, all operated by different members of the crew. Back here in the space hab, we had both science and technology experiments, as well as all of the cargo that would be eventually transferred uh, back and forth to the Mir. Of course, we had many mission objectives. Uh, our primary one was to exchange the crew members, uh, Andy Thomas and Dave Wolf, and along with that, the cargo that you can see shown here. The Space Hab ha is a multi-disciplinary uh, objective type of uh, pressurized cargo holder. Uh, we can perform experiments from around the world in it. In this particular scene, uh, I'm setting up a radiation experiment from Japan called the Real-Time Radiation Monitor that actually looks at the radiation that we're exposed to in an anomaly in the Earth's uh, magnetic field called the South Atlantic Anomaly. This is part of it called the detector unit. Also had some uh, biospecimens on it that looked at the effect of radiation on uh, regeneration. Over on the right, those spheres uh, are part of another radiation experiment. Here we're using materials of different thicknesses to shield uh, from the radiation, determining what the best materials are to be used in future space station and exploration vehicle design. On the flight deck, this digital camera pointed out over the window and was connected to a computer, which students from across the country commanded to to take pictures of the Earth. We also used a computer, a laptop, to look at our human performance or reflexes in space as a function of the environment. In addition to things that we looked at in space, we did look at things on the ground with some of our payloads. In this case, the mechanics of granular materials was actually looking at what happens in soils in earthquake and landslide terrains where soils can fail. By modeling these features on, on orbit, we are able to take advantage of the lack of gravity, which overprints most of the forces, so we're able to look at the small forces at work in these systems. He is right on course to rendezvous with the space station Mir. That's going to be happening just a short time from now. Endeavor is to link up with the Russian station and drop off astronaut Andy Thomas. Thomas will be replacing Dave Wolf, uh, a U.S. astronaut who has been on Mir since September. Mission control officials say all is going well. There are no delays expected. Thomas will be the seventh and the last U.S. astronaut scheduled to live aboard Mir in the current exchange program between the two countries. Hello and welcome. Coming up on this edition of World News, the presidential shopping trip that could be used as evidence against the president. And why the Clinton sex scandal is making bigger headlines in the Middle East than the stalled peace talks. While the crew of Space Station Mir gets ready to welcome a few guests in just a few minutes from now. Docking is prepared between the U.S. Space Shuttle and the Space Station to pick up one U.S. astronaut and deliver another. following is CNN's coverage of a live event. The U.S. Space Shuttle Endeavor closing in on the Russian space station Mir. Let's join CNN's live coverage at the docking. Contact and capture taking place on time at 2.14 p.m. Central Time today as the two spacecraft were at an altitude of about 212 nautical miles or 243 statute miles traveling over southern Russia, just southeast of Kiev and west of Kazakhstan, just north of the Caspian Sea. All right, there we see it. Uh, the docking has taken place just as we joined this live coverage. We heard there about one minute ago the, uh, the two spacecraft successfully docked. We're having a little bit of problems uh, with the picture there. And these continuing television views from onboard Mir as the two spacecraft are now docked. All right, there it was. Uh, 
It's gotten down to be almost routine, but of course it was a docking procedure, an experimental docking procedure that caused so many problems for Mir last year, as you can remember, causing all of the damage on board the spacecraft. Uh, we'll continue to follow the story and give you the updates as uh, more of the supplies and a U.S. astronaut are taken aboard the Mir. Has uh, made its rendezvous with the Russian space station Mir, docking just moments ago. Endeavour will unload tons of supplies and one astronaut after a five-day hookup. Endeavour is to return to Earth with U.S. astronaut David Wolf, who's been aboard Mir since September. That is World News for now. I'm Jim Clancy. Thanks for being with us. Style is up next for our viewers in Europe, while the rest of our viewers can see Q&A. Endeavour docked Saturday on a mission to deliver tons of supplies and one U.S. astronaut. Andrew Thomas will spend four and one-half months on board Mir. Endeavour will bring astronaut David Wolf back to Earth. The U.S. Space Agency is gaining experience for the International Space Station mission. The space station could be in orbit before the turn of the century. John Holloman at CNN Center in Atlanta. We're going to take you live to space. And uh, over my shoulder and uh, up in the corner of your screen, you can see two pictures. One um, on the left of your screen is being transmitted from the Mir space station. On the right of your screen, it's being transmitted from the flight deck of Space Shuttle Endeavour. The hatch on the Mir side of your screen, the picture that just went to black there, uh, has been opened. And what is uh, happening right now in space is that the shuttle astronauts, some of them, are preparing to go down to their side of the connecting tunnel between the two spaceships and uh, open the door on the shuttle side to Mir. It'll probably take a couple more minutes for this to happen because they have to do a pressure equalization check to make this all happen. On your screen, you see on the left, uh, Joe Edwards, who's the pilot of the space shuttle. In the middle, Bonnie Dunbar, the payload commander for Endeavour. And uh, shuttle commander um, Terry Wolcott is on the right of your screen. They are both looking at gauges uh, up on the flight deck of the shuttle to make sure that the pressure is equalized correctly before the hatch is opened. NASA commentator, um, commentators are uh, providing coverage of what is going on. Let's listen in to them for a moment or two and we'll get the latest information on how this hatch opening is going. While we wait for that, um, we can look, on the, uh, look at the Russian side of things again. Mir Commander Anatoly Solovyov is in the, uh, the middle of the picture on the uh, upper left-hand side of your screen. He's gotten a haircut for this docking ceremony. His hair has been much longer in times that we've seen him over the past uh, five or six months of his stay on Mir. And uh, he is at the hatch, the uh, hatch on the Russian side of the space station. Um, if you look closely at this picture, up uh, at the top of your screen, you can see a round thing that looks sort of like a donut. That is the Mir hatch. And um, in the background, sort of in the center of your screen, you can see the hatch on the other side, the shuttle hatch. Um, the arm and upside down human body that you see at the top of your screen is, um, well, I can't see the face. It's, uh, oh, it's astronaut Dave Wolf, the American who's been living on Mir for the past four and a half months. He and I have had numerous conversations during his stay, and he uh, has lived through some somewhat harrowing time on Mir. It's, uh, he said it's never been life-threatening, but uh, two weeks ago he had to live in 97 degree uh, Fahrenheit, 36 degree centigrade temperatures uh, on Mir because uh, the main air conditioner on the Russian space station failed. Now at the bottom of your screen is uh, Mir's flight engineer, um, Pavel Vinogradov. Now we see Commander Solovyev talking to Russian ground controllers on his headset. Uh, as soon as the pressure is equalized between the two uh, spaceships in this docking tunnel that you can see before you, then um, um, the hatch will open. It uh, appears to me, at least at this moment, that it's going to be delayed another few minutes. We'll be back and we'll watch it together when it happens. John Holloman, CNN International, reporting. <laughs> This has been a CNN Live event. Endeavour will drop off supplies and a fresh astronaut to relieve a somewhat homesick David Wolf. Joining me now with more on that mission is CNN's John Holloman. John? Marina, Dave Wolf told us a couple days ago that he would stay another four months if he had to, but he's uh, now all packed and ready to come home. After two days of playing catch-up, 
Shuttle Endeavour kissed the side of Space Station Mir in a perfect docking. It happened about two hours ago as the ships zoomed over Kiev and the Caspian Sea in darkness. They were traveling at 27,000 kilometers per hour at the time. What you see there on your screen, the orange uh, thing in the middle of your screen, were uh, the docking tunnel on Mir and the flashing lights you just saw there, also from Mir. Then, uh, after a process of checking both ships for damage, in which they found no damage, and checking for leaks of precious air, which they are finalizing at this instant, the hatch between the two ships expected to be opened at any moment. There you see astronaut Bonnie Dunbar, and uh, that may be Andy Thomas, the uh, next resident of Mir, there in the center of your screen. Hatch opening, as we say, expected at any moment. Uh, it, it could come up in the next couple minutes while we're here, and if so, we'll show it to you. At any rate, with the two ships mated, the astronauts have a busy time ahead of them. They'll be transferring tons of supplies, including 650 kilograms of water from Endeavour to Mir. Andy Thomas and Dave Wolf will trade places, with Wolf ending his four-and-a-half-month stay in orbit, while Thomas begins his four months of space residency on the Russian space station. Mir's Russian crew is planning to leave for home three weeks after the shuttle leaves. This is kind of complicated, Marina. For a while, there will be six or seven people up on Mir after the shuttle leaves. There'll be a new crew of cosmonauts, which will blast off for Mir the day after the shuttle leaves, and a French cosmonaut will spend three weeks with Andy Thomas and crewmates before returning to Earth with a departing Russian crew. NASA and Russian space agency managers tell CNN the lessons learned from this joint experience on Mir, which has lasted about two years, will make construction of the new International Space Station possible. Just to remind you, the first piece of new space station hardware built in Russia is on its way to the launch pad in Baikonur this week. It will go up in June to be followed in July by the first U.S. built of piece of the station, which is a docking node, which uh, our viewers got to see a couple of days ago at the uh, Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where it's getting ready for launch. So, about to open the door between the two spaceships. There's going to be a big party when they do. Uh, when that happens, I'm sure our viewers will get to see it with us. Marina? Thank you very much, John Holloman. And here we bring you live coverage of a live event of a hatch opening in space between Mir and Endeavour crews. After two days of playing catch-up, Shuttle Endeavour kissed the side of space station Mir in a perfect docking, and that happened two hours ago as the ship zoomed over Kiev and the Caspian Sea at 27,000 kilometers per hour. And then, after an hour-long process of checking both ships for damage and uh, leaks of precious air, the hatch between the two ships was opened to a wild celebration. And here you see a couple of the astronauts uh, greeting each other, very happy that this mission was successful. And now that the two ships are mated, the astronauts will transfer tons of supplies, including 650 kilograms of water from Endeavour to Mir. Andy Thomas and Dave Wolf will trade places. Uh, Wolf uh, is ending his four-and-a-half-month stay in orbit. And here we'll listen in for a moment to see what they're saying. And that was CNN's live coverage of the opening of the hatch in the shuttle between Mir and Endeavour. And that is our report for now. World Sport is next. I'm Marina Comey. Thank you so much for watching. This has been a CNN Live event. Well, on flight day three, we got set up and started doing the rendezvous. The rendezvous actually began uh, with our, 
our launch, and uh, we basically chase the, the mirror around the Earth till we catch up through a series of burns. This depicts the way we rendezvous with mirror. We come up from below, and we uh, try to position ourselves to stay within the green corridor. This is a view from the, of the orbiter from mirror, and you can see uh, clearly some jets firing as we close. Again, a view out the top window. Uh, we rendezvoused at night, and uh, this works out uh, to be a lot better for visibility. We use cameras, and uh, sun glaring off parts of the mirror can uh, make our cameras bloom. This is Dave's view. It's a real pleasure watching you guys come out of the sky. And the actual docking itself. Couldn't even feel it from inside. Um, and this is the view out the back window, and as Mike has said previously, uh, there's no view quite like looking at a space station and the Earth uh, attached to the orbiter. This is a view through the hatches uh, into Mir, and you can kind of see some anticipation there on the part of Anatoly and Dave. Actual, some regret and some happiness when that hatch opens. <laughs> the hatch opening, it's uh, a Russian superstition not to shake hands across the hatch. It uh, brings you bad luck or across the threshold. So I'm going to pull the uh, Russian commander Anatoly into the uh, space shuttle. It's really quite emotional to uh, uh, rendezvous and dock and see friends at such a remote uh, outpost. And that's Anatoly, the Russian Mir commander. Here's Pavel, the Russian board engineer on board Mir. This is the man who remembers where everything is in the whole station. These two really uh, know how to live in space. Uh, Anatoly is one of the most experienced uh, space travelers in the world. It's interesting. Uh, Anatoly was also Bonnie's uh, commander when she was in uh, Star City training. About 13 months at one point uh, in 1994. And then Dave, <coughs> uh, we've got him back on American soil. Good to see you, Commander. And then the first thing we do is uh, get together for a meal. We have something to eat uh, with the Russians and exchange a few gifts uh, before we get uh, settled down to, to work. Amerikanische Raumfähre Endeavour hat 400 Kilometer über der Erde problemlos an der russischen Raumstation Mir angedockt. Die russischen Kosmonauten bekommen ein neues Crewmitglied. Andrew Thomas löst seinen Kollegen David Wolf ab, der seit September in der Raumstation arbeitet. Die Endeavour hat außerdem rund zwei Tonnen Nachschub für die Mir an Bord, darunter eine neue Klimaanlage sowie einen neuen Computer. An Bord der 46-jährige Andrew Thomas, der letzte Amerikaner auf der Mir. Er soll die Vorbereitungen auf die künftige internationale Raumstation leiten. Der Kommandant der Endeavour leistete Maßarbeit, als er das Shuttle mit Hilfe der Steuerdüsen an die Raumstation heranführte. Wenig später konnten sich die Besatzung der Mir und die Astronauten der Endeavour die Hände schütteln. Die Endeavour bringt drei Tonnen Material und Lebensmittel auf die Mir, unter anderem eine neue Klimaanlage und einen neuen Computer. In den nächsten Tagen werden die Raumfahrer wissenschaftliche Experimente durchführen. Am Donnerstag kehrt die Endeavour wieder zur Erde zurück. The US Space Shuttle Endeavour and the Russian Space Station Mir have linked up for a five-day rendezvous in space. Endeavour is delivering tons of needed supplies and one US astronaut. CNN's John Holloman has our report. Endeavour now within 25 feet. After two days of playing catch-up in space, Shuttle Endeavour lightly touched the docking ring outside the Mir Space Station, completing a major step in the continuing effort to build a new international station. And contact between Endeavour and the Mir space station confirmed on time. As the two ships were driven together, astronaut Dave Wolf, who spent the past four and a half months aboard Mir, showed up on the Russian station's flight deck. Then, an hour later, after a series of damage and leak checks, the hatch between the two ships opened to a surprise for astronaut Wolf. So we shook hands, and uh, the Russians will try to keep you from shaking hands across the hatch. It's you know, one of their superstitions, so I suspect they'll try to yank me on board. Uh, it's just excitement. You know, we'll be anxious to get Dave, and uh, Dave doesn't know it yet. And maybe he will after this, though. Uh, I have a big it's sign made up on it, but uh, Dave, it's time to come home. <laughs> and uh, it, it was nice. He's a very good friend of mine. We're in the same astronaut class, so uh, I'm kind of anxious. He was first assigned. You may remember, we were supposed to drop him off 
and uh, Wendy Lawrence was going to be on this mission. And Dave and I had sat down and talked about it. It would be much better if I was the one picking him up and dropping him off, and it's like what happened. I get to do that. The two spaceships will stay together until Thursday, and while they're connected, the astronauts will transfer 1,400 pounds of water from Endeavour to Mir, along with thousands of pounds of food, hygiene, supplies, and experiments to be conducted by Andy Thomas, the last astronaut to live on the Russian station. Thomas will spend the next four months on Mir, while Wolf will come home to his family in Indiana after Endeavour lands January 31st. John Holloman, CNN Atlanta. And Russian Mission Control is already focusing on its next voyage to Mir that is set for January 29. The crew assigned to the mission left Star City near Moscow on Saturday, headed for the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. The Kazakh, Russian and French spacemen said their goodbyes to family and friends for a while. The three are set for a long stay on the space station where they are to help design the interior of Mir's replacement, the Alpha International Space Station. The American Raumfähr Endeavour has vergangene Nacht 400 km über der Erde erfolgreich an die russische Raumstation Mir angedockt. Eineinhalb Stunden später trafen sich die Besatzungen. Der Kommandant der Endeavour, Terry Wilcott, schwebte als erster in die Mir. Die Endeavour bringt drei Tonnen Nachschub ins All, darunter Lebensmittel, Wasser und einen Ersatzcomputer. Über das Rendezvous freute sich besonders der heimwegeplagte US-Astronaut David Wolf. Er wird nach vier Monaten Arbeit in der Mir zur Erde zurückkehren. Here we are uh, in the Kristall module and you see the air hoses that provide ventilation, very important in zero gravity not to have dead spots and we can reroute these hoses as necessary to change the airflow uh, depending where the hot and cold spots are in the vehicle. That's a yellow oxygen tank we just saw on the left, there's a space suit on the right. This is a storage area, uh, and you can see that we have to transfer all the 9,000 items down this corridor to get into the rest of the Mir space station. It's not very wide. There's the area I slept in above. We pull ourselves with sets of these bungees. You see that black bungee on the top. So uh, we have prepared this area before the shuttle docked and cleared it. It's actually much more crowded than this uh, during actual life. Uh, storage lockers on the left, panels on the right. There are systems and storage behind all these panels. There's the treadmill above. That's really the floor. You might say we were upside down. We're approaching the, dot, the node, the main node to which all the modules, six main sections of the spati station are attached. Now we're turning, literally turning, rolling into the base block. These modules are attached, uh, so orientation is not necessarily the same in each module. And there's Andy. And we're spending our time uh, transferring information. I'm making sure he knows where things are and giving him the tips I've learned in four and a half months in space. And here we've turned to the Perota module. It's our main laboratory. It's mostly packed up at this point. I'd spent the last uh, two to three weeks uh, uh, packing up items. So uh, uh, final preparations. There's the computer, very important, as you, many purposes for a laptop on orbit, including watching videos, uh, which I had some, not much time to watch. Uh, but they were interesting as uh, they were, they impacted me strongly as an attachment to Earth. Uh, somehow the movies seemed very important. Dave was there in inventorying the materials and equipment that he's taken back to Earth, and here he's brought some of the stuff to Space Hab on uh, the orbiter. And we transferred approximately 9,000 pounds of of equipment, which covered all of Dave's equipment, plus all the stuff Andy was going to be using for the next four months. And that was approximately 1,400 items, all told. In zero-g, you have the advantage of being able to maneuver and carry the uh, items just about any way you want, as Terry was showing here. And one of the people who really helped out here was uh, Salajan Sharipov, our cosmonaut who was part of our crew. His knowledge of the mirror was invaluable in being able to transfer all that material. And even at the height of transfer, when we had stuff temp sewed all over the space lab, we were still able to operate as both a as a freighter and as a laboratory. This is uh, uh, module Quantum. You see some of the delivered things. This is uh, Jaradine. There are about 15 on the station that used for uh, latitude control. This is our pressurization unit. <laughs> this is a bioreactor and many medical discoveries will, that will be made in space that can't be made on the ground. Here we're growing three-dimensional cancer tissue, breast cancer, in a way it can't be grown on the ground, and this is a great tool for cancer research.
Well, this is a microgravity laboratory, and I'm way back in the back there, but working on a ex technology experiment that is going to be used for space station, looking at <coughs> contaminants in uh, our air, about 23 different compounds. has a lot of uh, technological applications to the ground as well. Uh, we also carried the first telemedicine instrumenta instrumentation package to orbit, which allows doctors on the ground to monitor crew members, for instance. Uh, here, uh, Terry's looking at my eye. He was taking my blood pressure earlier. We can send EKGs or heart monitoring data to the ground. It's also being used as a remote package in rural areas across the United States. Well, as they say, all good things have to come to an end, and after five days of docked operations, we exchanged the traditional gifts and said our goodbyes. Uh, Terry and Mike here prepared to close the hatch as Anatoly closes the hatch on the mirror side, followed by our closing of the hatch on the orbiter side. Wieder Schwierigkeiten an Bord der Mir. Diesmal stehen die Astronauten vor einem ungewöhnlichen Problem. Der Raumanzug für das neue Besatzungsmitglied Thomas ist zu klein. Nun soll aus mehreren Anzügen eine passende Arbeitskleidung für den Amerikaner geschneidert werden. Gestern Abend war Thomas von der Raumfähre Endeavour planmäßig in die Mir geschwebt, um seinen Kollegen Wolf abzulösen. Eine unendliche Pannengeschichte im Weltraum. Seit 1986 umkreist die russische Raumstation nun schon die Erde und hat seitdem mit immer neuen Problemen zu kämpfen. Abenteuerliche Reparaturen gehören fast zum Tagesablauf. Jüngste Panne, der Raumanzug für den amerikanischen Astronauten ist zu klein. Und das ist gar nicht komisch. Und das erklärt uns jetzt herzlich willkommen Ulf Merbold. Ja. Ähm, es ist ja so, dass Sie ein anerkannter Experte sind. Experte ist falsch. Und äh, wir ballern ja unendlich viel Geld in diese Projekte. Warum wird in die MIR eigentlich noch so viel investiert? Na, also da muss ich Sie doch ein bisschen korrigieren. Also wir ballern überhaupt nicht viel Geld in die MIR, mhm. sondern das sind die Russen. Und das, was wir für die Raumfahrt insgesamt ausgeben, für unsere eigenen Programme, ist eigentlich auch nicht so sehr viel. Dass in dem ein Journalist vom anderen das immer wieder übernimmt und abschreibt, wird es auch nicht wahr. Nee, ich habe aber heute zum Beispiel gelesen, es gibt ja die neue Meldung, dass eine neue Raumstation geplant ist in Zusammenarbeit mit anderen Echt? europäischen Ländern. Und die Gesamtsumme dieser Arbeit beläuft sich auf 200 Milliarden D-Mark. Stand heute in der Agentur. Das ist viel. Also Keine ich kann zu, dieser gesamten, zu den Gesamtkosten nicht ja. sagen, aber ich weiß, dass wir, mit wir meine ich jetzt die 14 Mitgliedsländer der ESA, ja. das heißt die Westeuropäer, an dieser Raumstation 5% bezahlen. Mhm. Und da äh, muss man sich das überlegen, das wird nochmal durch 14 geteilt. Und dabei bilden diese 14 Länder die reichste Region dieser Welt. Mhm. Ich denke eigentlich, dann ist es doch ein recht bescheidener Beitrag zu diesem Versuch, die Erfahrungshorizonte zu verschieben. Da möchte ich sagen, muss man den Russen doch eigentlich großen Respekt zollen. Denen geht es sehr viel schlechter als uns. Und die leisten da sehr viel mehr. Sie waren auf der Mir und haben die Zusammenarbeit der Russen hautnah äh, doch nach, nachvollziehen können. Ähm, was unterscheidet denn die russische Art zu arbeiten, zum Beispiel von der amerikanischen? Eigentlich sind die Unterschiede gering. Die Amerikaner haben ein hochleistungsfähiges Transportsystem, ihren Shuttle, mit dem sie in den Weltraum gelangen und dabei fast 30 Tonnen an Material mitnehmen können. Die Russen haben nur die kleine Soyuz-Kapsel, äh, da hat man zu dritt große Probleme, überhaupt Platz zu finden. Wir haben ein so paar Bilder. Ist. Vielleicht können Sie da was zu sagen. Ja, wir haben hier eine kleine Matz ja, vorbereitet. Erklären Sie ist, doch mal, was da passiert. Das ist jetzt ein Start, möglicherweise sogar meiner in der Nacht. Und äh, ja, hier sind wir jetzt auf dem Weg in den Orbit zu dieser Raumstation Mir. Die Kapsel hat nur zwei Meter Durchmesser. Und äh, da muss man zu dritt sitzen. Man kann die Beine nicht ausstrecken. Wenn man dann dort oben an dieser Station ankommt, allerdings, äh, dann hat man recht viel Auslauf. Das ist jetzt schon äh, der Moment der Rückkehr. War in der Steppe in Kasachstan, als wir dann im November 1994 dort gelandet waren. 
Jetzt ist ja als äh, Schlusspunkt einer ganzen Reihe von kleineren und auch größeren Pannen bei der Mir äh, die Geschichte mit dem Raumanzug passiert. Ich habe mitgekriegt, einfach so aus in meinem Bekanntenkreis, dass die Leute darüber kichern. Das ist aber eigentlich äh, ein schwerwiegendes Problem. Können Sie mir das mal erklären, was es damit auf sich hat? Na gut, also es gibt zwei verschiedene Arten von Raumanzügen, die riechen großen Schweren mit diesem Rucksack mit denen man tatsächlich aussteigen kann, mhm. um dann für etwa sechs Stunden im freien Weltraum zu arbeiten. Und dann den Raumanzug, um den es nach meiner Ansicht sich hier handelt, den man sicherheitshalber in dieser kleinen Soyuz-Kapsel während der Reise zu mir und auch während der Rückkehr trägt, der hat nur den Sinn, den Astronauten, Kosmonauten das Leben zu retten, für den Fall, dass die Kapsel ein Leck bekäme und die Luft verlöre. Der Fall ist aber überhaupt noch nie eingetreten. Mhm. Und das ist so ungefähr wie die Schwimmweste, die man auf dem Schiff äh, verpasst bekommt und man hofft, dass man sie eben nie braucht. Ist denn sowas überhaupt zu reparieren da oben? Jetzt ist der Anzug da. Ja, ich denke, da sind in den Ärmeln und auch in den Beinen so Gurte. Das kann man nachher noch ein bisschen nachjustieren. Und ich bin schon zuversichtlich, dass die das am Ende doch noch ja. packen und den Anzug passen können. Wie geht es denn Ihnen, wenn Sie so ins All starten? Haben Sie da Angst oder denken Sie, wow, Technik, alles okay, es geht ab? Na gut, muss man doch genauer darüber reden, was man dann unter Angst versteht. Also sicher nicht Angst in dem Sinn, dass es einem, dass der Hals eng mhm. wird und äh, trocken. Natürlich weiß jeder, der dort startet, wenn Sie mal den Shuttle nehmen, dass diese Kiste, die da 2000 Tonnen wiegt, zu mehr als 90 Prozent aus brennbaren äh, Treibstoffen besteht. Es kommt deswegen schon darauf an, dass mhm. die Technik perfekt funktioniert. Man macht sich in extremem Maße abhängig vom Funktionieren der Maschinen. Aber man hat ja nun Jahre trainiert und viele Notfälle im Training erlebt und dabei Gelegenheit gehabt, Vertrauen zu sich, zur Technik und vor allem auch zu seinen Mitfliegern äh, zu gewinnen. Man erlebt ja dann, dass man die meisten Probleme, die einem im Training aufgegeben werden, lösen kann und dann steigt man doch relativ gelassen ein. Wann geht es wieder los? Ja, in meinem Fall es sieht es so aus, jetzt müssen erstmal unsere jüngeren Astronauten alle drankommen. Dann, aber Sie sind ein erfahrener Astronaut. Ja, das stimmt. Aber das gehört natürlich auch zum, zur Professionalität. Sowas gelingt ja nur im Team, die anderen auch mal dran zu lassen. Dafür wünsche ich Ihnen viel Glück und wenn Sie wieder hochfahren, wir sind dabei. Mit Sicherheit. Ja, Vielen Dank, dass Sie einige vielmal. Dinge versucht haben zu erklären. Dankeschön, Ulf Merwald. Shuttle Endeavour are continuing their united race through space at 27,000 kilometers an hour. It is the fourth day that the two craft have been linked in space. Earlier, we spoke with astronaut Jim Riley aboard the craft. Everything has been going really smooth with the uh, joint efforts between our two crews. We've managed to transfer just about everything. We've got over a thousand items we've already transferred, and we're just cleaning up the last ones right now. Endeavour and Mir are to remain docked until Thursday. Earlier, we spoke to Mir's newest resident, Australian-born astronaut Andy Thomas. He responded to reports that Russian officials thought that he was being capricious when he discovered problems with the fit of the Russian spacesuit. No, the suit problem was real. I mean, I couldn't get it on. I tried with uh, Anatoly, the commander here, several times to get it on, and it, it was just impossible until we uh, made the adjustments, and then it went on fine. Uh, no, I'm prepared to uh, undertake this mission now, and uh, I'm looking forward to setting up a, a home in the Perota module and uh, uh, getting some personal things out and making it livable and uh, starting the adventure. And Thomas is scheduled to spend the next four months aboard Mir. A language barrier may be the next challenge that a U.S. astronaut on board the space station Mir will face. The first was a tight-fitting spacesuit, but with a bit of tailoring, Andy Thomas made the suit fit. Russian space officials criticized the astronaut for not checking the size more carefully before the launch. Now his crewmates are questioning Andy Thomas's Russian language skills. 
Thomas is the seventh and last U.S. astronaut to live on Mir. He is scheduled to return in May. The three-man crew was positioned on the launch pad in Kazakhstan. Liftoff is scheduled for Thursday. The crew will include two Russian cosmonauts, both of whom have spent time aboard the Mir before. They will be joined by a French Air Force pilot who will spend three weeks aboard Mir conducting scientific and also medical experiments. Zu Mir steht wieder ein Schichtwechsel bevor. Vom Weltraumbahnhof Baikonur soll am Nachmittag die Soyuz Raumkapsel starten. An Bord ein russisch-französisches Forscherteam. Hauptaufgabe der neuen Besatzung werden Reparaturen an der pannengeplagten Raumstation sein. Wir sollen mehrere schon dringend notwendige Reparaturen an der Raumstation durchführen. Der Franzose Leopold Ea wird drei Wochen im All bleiben und wissenschaftliche Experimente durchführen. Der Flug zu mir dauert ungefähr zwei Tage. Zeitgleich zum Start des Soyuz soll die US-Raumfähre Endeavour von der Mir ablegen und zur Erde zurückkehren. Die Raumfahrtbehörde schickt am Abend neue Besatzungsmitglieder zur Weltraumstation. Unter ihnen auch ein Franzose. Abschiedsveranstaltung in Baikonur in Kasachstan. Von hier startet das russisch-französische Team mit einer Soyuz-Rakete. Nur wenige Minuten nach dem Start soll die US-Raumfähre Endeavour von der Mir abkoppeln. Endeavour war fünf Tage lang zu Besuch und hatte eine Menge Nachschub gebracht. Mit der amerikanischen Raumfähre kehren sieben Amerikaner zur Erde zurück. Unter ihnen der NASA-Astronaut David Wolf, der vier Monate lang im All war. But two Russian cosmonauts and a French colleague, Leopold Ahar, are about to head for Mir. The team is scheduled to lift off from the Baikonur Launch Center in Kazakhstan on Thursday. Their Soyuz spacecraft is to rendezvous with Mir 48 hours after takeoff. Ahar is scheduled to conduct a series of medical and scientific experiments during his three-week stay. Cosmonauts Talgat Musabayev and Nikolai Budarin are to handle some repairs on Mir over the next six months of Mir and Endeavour bid adieu today. The space shuttle and the space station are parting company. They've been joined since Saturday when Endeavour arrived to pick up astronaut David Wolf and drop off Andy Thomas. This spring, a shuttle crew takes into space some very special experiments involving the production of fertilizer and medicines. Experiments designed by high school students in Utah and Idaho. So, for instance, like if you had a, a medicine that needed a certain crystalline structure, you might be able to look back at what we did and see, oh, wow, that's kind of the, the crystalline structure that we're looking for. The following is CNN's coverage of a live event. Hello, I'm Riz Khan at the CNN Center in Atlanta. We're interrupting our programming to bring you live coverage from Baikonur in Kazakhstan. A Soyuz rocket's being launched, carrying a new crew to the Russian Mir space station. Well, CNN's resident space expert, John Holliman's with us here on the set in Atlanta to explain what's happening. John? Well, it's going to be a very busy next uh, 30 minutes in space, Riz. You've got the space shuttle, which is attached to the Mir space station like this. And you've got a Soyuz rocket with three new crew members from Mir on the ground, ready to launch. Uh, the shuttle has got to be out of the way before that rocket gets here, but it doesn't have to leave until after the launch. So the launch is going to happen in a couple of minutes. We should probably go now live to the picture of the launch so we can talk about that. After it is launched, the shuttle will back away from here and go on around the world. You can see it's pretty dark at uh, Baikonur, Kazakhstan. But uh, as soon as that countdown proceeds to a point where the rocket goes up, it will be very bright. Now, we'll listen uh, carefully. I'll try to... Um, do a little uh, kind of pigeon Russian translation of how the countdown is going. The launch scheduled for uh, uh, sometime in the next two, well, one minute and 45 seconds. So we can, uh, we can watch this. On board the, uh, uh, the rocket that's going up uh, with the Soyuz capsule at the top of the rocket is the new Mir commander, Talgat Musabayev and his flight engineer, Nick Budarin. I've met uh, Budarin at the uh, Cosmonaut Training Center in Russia. Great guy, um, a party animal. And uh, hmm, Commander Musabayev is a little bit concerned about what he's going to find when he gets to Mir. He is worried that Andy Thomas, the astronaut who has just set up housekeeping there and begins his first full day as a Mir crew member uh, after the shuttle leaves today, is, uh, is not a good enough Russian speaker to help out in an emergency. And what about uh, their tasks up there, John? What are they gonna have to do? Well, they've got, uh, the new crew has got science experiments. They've got a couple of spacewalks planned that they have to participate in. 
Thomas is qualified for a spacewalk, but as things stand now, he's not going to conduct one. I was with him in his spacesuit training in Russia, and uh, it's a difficult spacesuit to get your body into. I'll tell you, it's, it's very difficult to get into, and it is extremely tiring for uh, anybody, me certainly, Thomas uh, also, to operate that spacesuit. So they're going to do a little bit more fix-up, but Mir is in better condition today than it has been any time in the past four months. Now we've got uh, the, the Frenchman joining the crew uh, on the Soyuz rocket, aren't, haven't we? That's right. He is, uh, he is going to conduct... Oh, by the way, let's uh, point out what we've got to for our viewers. Occasionally, you will see a camera inside the Soyuz capsule of the three crew members. Commander is in the middle. Flight engineer will be on the left of your screen, and uh, the French uh, astronaut will be, or cosmonaut, will be on the right of your screen as we see them go up during launch. And uh, we might hear some commentary from them as they go up, but most likely it would be in Russian. But and he, uh, he was supposed to have gone up before, but because of the damage, uh, he couldn't go up. Yeah, he was supposed to go up uh, in the middle of the summer for a three-week um, series of experiments that the French Space Agency had uh, wanted to conduct for a long, long time. And there's a nice color picture from inside the capsule. We'll just continue to watch these things as we get closer to the moment of launch. It is getting very close now. If, uh, uh, if our clock here is accurate, and I believe it is, and the clock in mission control is accurate, we're going to see the Soyuz rocket lift off momentarily. Let's listen to the final seconds of the count. Mm -hmm. There it goes. Fiery launch from the plains of Kazakhstan as the rocket uh, leaves the ground. You can see the crew members from this uh, live camera inside. And again, about 20 seconds into the flight, it will begin a pitch maneuver, putting it on the uh, launch azimuth, which is 51.6 degrees inclination, that to match the uh, that of the Mir space station. Again, the crew uh, on board the uh, uh, Soyuz capsule as a vehicle now heading out uh, downrange from uh, its launch site. It's the voice of NASA commentator Kyle Herring. So we're getting some picture from uh, our, our European Forty seconds suppliers. into the flight, uh, we should hear calls or calls are made to check the chamber pressures in uh, all of the propellant systems on board the uh, rocket. They'll orbit for a couple of days, remember, John? Yes, they will. Uh, it takes about uh, a day and a half, two uh, days to uh, catch minute, up. Uh, since launch, again, another chamber pressure check to ensure that all of the systems are healthy. And again, we're viewing the crew members uh, inside the capsule, the Commander Talgut Musabayev and uh, Nikolai Badarin, the commander and the flight engineer. And there's another camera inside the, uh, the capsule now, that uh, so may the show the, uh, the French another, cosmonaut. Uh, the, in fact, uh, the French cosmonaut has the switches the for the camera. He can switch back and forth. <laughs> and um, uh, he He's may just want to keep the other guys on there. Yeah. <laughs> He's just, the it's like first launch for him. And... Now, John, will the, uh, the fact that the Mir has had some damage and has had some problems going to affect the... Uh, the, the swapping, if you like, of the two uh, spacecraft. Well, one of the things that's going to be different, uh, Riz, is that uh, the two, there are going to be a couple of Soyuz capsules attached to the Mir space station for the next three weeks. Mm -hmm. the, um, the crew that is on board Mir now, the Russian crew, the cosmonauts, have become the most experienced repair men for a space station in history. Anatoly Solovyov, uh, the Mir commander, conducted all these spacewalks over the past uh, six months and brought Mir back into shape after, uh, in the six months before, they had the wreck, they had constant leaks, they had problems with every system on board, there was antifreeze in their eyes. Now we're looking at the, uh, the viewing stand where, uh, no, nope, this is uh, actually some uh, videotape from earlier as the cosmonaut crew was getting ready. Now we're back to live pictures from space as they are in the capsule. They're hoping to feel weightlessness. You saw mm -hmm. um, um, uh, Badar and the flight engineer wiggle his arm to see if it would float away. Uh, these spacesuits that they are wearing, by the way, are the same ones that uh, astronaut Andy Thomas had trouble with, the same type of suit. You only use them when you're in the Mir capsule. And, uh, yeah, and totally custom built, as you say. Yeah, and they had to uh, readjust Andy's suit because his body apparently stretched when he became weightless. And John, you were saying that uh, just before we started listening in that uh, it takes them about a day and a half to catch up, so they'll be, uh, it, it'll be a day and a half before they reach? Yeah, there's the Frenchman. Oh, he finally is. turned on his own camera, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, he seems pretty happy. Uh, you can see there is right up between the words mirror and crew on your TV screen. Mm -hmm. There is a floating object uh, in there. It is not floating. It is not weightless because there is, uh, that's the way people on the ground can tell how much... Uh, 
the force of gravity is mm -hmm. pushing against the spacecraft. Uh, when they uh, reach their, uh, their orbital velocity and, and stop zooming ahead, that uh, object, whatever it is on a string, will float up uh, to the top of the capsule. That's the way people on the ground can tell sort of how the, how the mission is going. Sometimes the simplest things work the best. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, the, the space shuttle has no equivalent set of pictures to these. They have a, a camera which sometimes works in the crew cabin for a few seconds after launch, but uh, I'd say uh, you know, we should stay with these pictures as long as we can, just because we can. Uh -huh. Um, but the human body is under as much uh, pressure as it ever gets under in this situation. Uh, three to four times normal weight is how their body's They do seem quite comfortable, though, John. Yep, yep, they do. And uh, they're, this is the thing that you train for most if you go through the cosmonaut training school at the Gagarin Training Center uh, outside Moscow. How to ride up and down in, this, in the Soyuz capsule. will be a shutdown of the second stage engines. Yes, sir, we're hearing from our commentator that uh, the, the second stage engine is about to shut down. And about five seconds after second stage engine shut down, the second stage will, uh, uh, the second stage's uh, main, uh, small jets engines will shut down, then the main engine will shut down, followed uh, shortly by uh, second stage separation. I think we've just about lost our picture from you. Yeah. Well, we've got some idea of what's going to happen, John. Of course, we'll get back to you and, and see what's happening, keep up with the progress of what's happening in space. That's right. Space shuttle itself will detach in about 20 minutes. We'll come back and watch that if we've got picture to show. Good. Thanks. And we appreciate your, uh, your views into that because, of course, you know it better than any of us here, for sure, <laughs> and probably better than some of the guys up there, too. I doubt that. <laughs> John Holloman joining us on the set here in Atlanta. And, of course, we will keep you updated on the events in space. Stay tuned. There's news coming up on CNN in about 20 minutes' time. <laughs> This has been a CNN Live event. Hello, I'm Riz Khan at the CNN Center in Atlanta. We're interrupting our programming to bring you live coverage from the latest mission to the Russian space station Mir. A Soyuz rocket launched about 20 minutes ago from the Baikonur Cosmodrome launch pad in Kazakhstan carrying a new crew to Mir as it makes its way over the next couple of days to the space station. The shuttle Endeavour, which is linked to Mir, has to undock and that process is about to begin. To talk us through that, John Holliman, our expert in space and on mm -hmm. CNN. All right, Riz, here's what's going to happen in two minutes. The shuttle um, Endeavour is now attached to the Mir space station at this position. And uh, we're getting some pictures down from space, perhaps from just on the other side, right in this area where astronaut Andy Thomas has been looking out the window. The shuttle will back away to a distance of about 10 meters, and um, then it will go out to about 100 meters, and then the shuttle will begin to fly in a big circle all the way around Mir with its cameras on and uh, all the astronauts taking pictures, and we'll be able to see some of those pictures as it takes pictures of Mir and all the damage that's uh, been done to it, and we'll do a survey of what's going on on the outside. Uh, the pictures from space, I would predict for you, are much better than anything I can do with my models here on the set. And uh, if we can see those pictures, I can talk you through what is going on. All right, uh, the pictures from space are not coming in at this instant. Mm -hmm. The communication from the uh, Russian space station is, um, uh, is very much more complicated than communication from the shuttle. The shuttle has a satellite TV antenna out in the cargo bay that uh, can sometimes point at the Earth. That antenna can't be used right now because they're using it instead of as a TV antenna, they're using it as a radar antenna to very carefully judge the distance as the shuttle backs away from the Mir space station. Uh, shuttle pilot Joe Edwards, who has not been at the controls of the shuttle except for uh, several minor maneuvers during this mission, gets his first chance at the stick. Mm -hmm. He told me uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking in Houston that uh, he wants to make it look very easy. Um, and um, he said uh, it's sort of like uh, the American football quarterback Joe Namath. You see him in the Super Bowl and he throws great passes every time. What you don't see is him practicing day after day after day. And Edward says he has been practicing on the ground for about 60 days as to precisely how to get the shuttle to back away from the Russian station without impacting on any of the solar panels. And you can see this thing is a, is a jungle of uh, very delicate solar panels that are out there. I think, and, uh, uh, John, we're going to try to get to those pictures in space uh, any good. moment now. We can see uh, something coming up in just a moment. All right, um, good. I think the uh, angle that you're going to see at home will be the angle from a camera right in here, inside the Mir docking port. It will look down. It'll see much of the shuttle as it backs away. And so it'll be a, uh, a, a cosmonaut's eye view of the shuttle slowly backing away. They've got an mm. animated uh, uh, shot of this here, I think, okay. that's being sent to us and now. Now, this is using real-time data. 
Um, the picture you see on your screen is very similar to the, uh, to the two models that I have been showing you. And uh, the way they conduct this maneuver, Riz, because the two ships have been... All right, the two ships are no longer touching. And uh, that's the voice of astronaut Bonnie Dunbar telling Anatoly Soloviev in Russian, the uh, commander of Mir, what is going on. Endeavour's crew confirming physical separation of Endeavour from the Mir space station. There are some jets on the space shuttle that uh, have to be engaged. You see, uh, that's, uh, that's the, uh, the pattern of uh, jet fumes from those jets. And instead of being able to fire the jets directly at Mir, which would get them rapidly away, they have to fire these jets in this way so that uh, you can come back to me on camera. I'll show you what the shuttle is doing to separate from Mir. And um, uh, the maneuver is a, is a wiggle maneuver. It has to sort of wiggle its way. Well, this is the actual orientation in space. It has to wiggle its way like a fishtail, sort of moving away from Mir, because if they were to fire any of the jets up here in the nose of the shuttle, they would go right into Mir. They would do damage to the solar panels, the radiators out on the crystal module where the shuttle has been docked for all these days. And um, um, so what it will do is, um, is continue to move out sort of like this. The orientation in the graphic that you saw on your screen earlier was uh, one that showed the shuttle below Mir, which is mm -hmm. in fact the way they are flying in space. The Earth is uh, over here someplace. Mm -hmm. And um, the Earth's gravity will tend to pull the shuttle a little bit away, too, after they disconnect. And so it may be a silly question, but how do they get a chance to practice this kind of maneuver? I mean, there are people who drive all their lives and still can't handle a car. So how can they, they do something as They have a computer almost identical to your computer that you mm -hmm. use to, to get the news and uh, make our equipment here work, Riz. And um, it has got the precise maneuvers from previous dockings that have been done. And you have a, a joystick, just identical to the sh uh, stick on the shuttle, and you move the stick very slightly, and that causes these rockets mm -hmm. at various locations on the shuttle to fire. And um, they can, uh, in the computer simulator, they can put in problems, like what happens if half the jets don't work at the time you do this. Um, what we are hearing, and I'm listening to the Russian and trying to, as I say, do a little pigeon translating as we get this in, is uh, an indication that everything is going well. You can see now in the uh, uh, graphic that is uh, being generated by the onboard computers on the shuttle. That the shuttle has now two spacecraft now about 30 feet, about 10 meters apart now. And as you can see, the, the way these jets are firing, they're jets all over the body of the shuttle. None of the ones that point to Mir are, uh, are being used in this. And um, so the situation is that the shuttle will attempt to fly down the green cone that you see uh, from the center of your screen on down. But uh, when it's very close to Mir, the width of that cone is only, uh, it's less than a meter um, in width. Now we're looking at uh, some computer screens that are being generated at Mission Control at NASA in Houston, Texas, that are showing the operators there uh, not only what it looks like, but what the uh, specific readings are. You'd have to be a rocket scientist to be able to translate much of what uh, is coming down to us from NASA. But uh, you can see, and, uh, and we can hear, that the two ships are uh, um, now um, 14 meters, roughly, apart. And uh, this will be a very slow movement. It'll get faster as uh, the two ships get further apart, and as the shuttle gets out to about this orientation, then they'll do then this they'll fly do the maneuver. Okay, how far would that be, did they say? Um, they said uh, 240 feet, which okay. is, um, help me here. No. Right. Okay, now we've Put got down. live pictures. Now, these are pictures from uh, the shuttle, and they are looking back at the Mir space station through a porthole on the shuttle. You can see, what I'll do is I'll take our model and orient it so that our camera here in Atlanta can see sort of the same orientation that that camera uh, in space is showing us. Uh, it's just inside the docking tunnel. And um, uh, to update our viewers who've, um, uh, who've been away for a moment, uh, the two spaceships have separated successfully. The shuttle is, uh, is moving back to a distance of 240 feet. Help me with the metric yeah, conversion. Yeah, I think about 150 meters. 150 meters apart now. And no, 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 or when they, when they finally that, get that. to where they're going. At any rate, it's uh, generally about 100 about meters. Meters. About is where they, meters. About 50 meters, actually. Yeah. Out to, yeah. um, um, where they do this fly around. It's very close, considering the size of these two spaceships. And, um, um, you know, Mir has had a lot of trouble. Uh, uh, there uh, have been accidents. The uh, Spectre module which the shuttle will get to see on this fly around, has a solar panel that has been severely damaged and disconnected from the power production system. They'll be able to look at that area of Mir. In the past, when the shuttle has done this fly around, 
Um, the uh, cosmonauts on board have put some air into the, uh, into the sealed Spectre module just so that some debris might fly out of the leaking hole on it. The Russians still have hope of finding that leak and figuring out a way to uh, repair it so that the Spectre module could be used for scientific results. Uh, since the 25th of June, it has been sealed off completely, unable uh, to be used as a sleeping compartment for the American astronaut, which means that um, astronauts have slept up in the airlock. Uh, the airlock in this picture is dead center in your screen. It is a, a small section of mirror, but it's big enough for a human body and a couple of spacesuits. And of course, when we spoke with the astronauts yesterday, John, you, uh, you, first thing they said was how crammed they felt it was. Yeah, yeah, Andy Thomas especially, yeah. the fellow who's uh, going to have to live there for the next four months. He and, uh, he and the Russians are having some uh, interesting um, communication using the news media to talk about their dissatisfaction <laughs> with things. Thomas yeah. over the weekend said he was dissatisfied with the Russian spacesuit, and the Russian uh, deputy mission controller in uh, in Moscow said nothing wrong with our spacesuit. <laughs> this guy is just being capricious. And we asked Andy Thomas about it yesterday, and he said no, spacesuit really didn't fit. I had to. I was really worried about it. And uh, now that that problem has been solved, the new uh, the commander of the uh, Soyuz and the new commander of Mir, who's going up into space, says. He's very concerned because uh, Andy Thomas can't speak Russian very well. Thomas was originally not going to the Mir space station, but because of a problem back uh, in the summer and early fall, uh, it was decided that Dave Wolf uh, was going to go to the space station four months early, which meant that Andy Thomas would have to get ready in a hurry to be the backup astronaut uh, to go to Mir. And so uh, he, Thomas has, been, uh, has told me uh, back in October when I was with him in Moscow, and as recently as yesterday, that the problems with the language are the biggest problems mm -hmm. that he is afraid he's going to have to face. And of course, uh, the next shuttle is the, is the last one that goes to Mir, isn't it? Yeah. John? It'll be going up um, in four months mm -hmm. to um, pick up Andy Thomas. And uh, at this point, at least, there will not be another astronaut there going up to Mir. Uh, the Russians are hitting NASA up. Come on, why don't you send one more astronaut? There are a couple who are well trained to do it. Uh, Wendy Lawrence, who was supposed to be on Mir, is uh, trained, and Bonnie Dunbar, who's up on the shuttle, you hear her voice speaking Russian with a you know, female lilt, uh, who is trained to go to Mir and would like to go, and uh, so it's possible this could change. Now, I don't know what we're seeing now, but the camera is obviously moving around. Okay, that's looking down in the roof windows of the shuttle. Um, and uh, you can see um, the, the two overhead windows, you can see if they'll keep the camera steady or zoom in a little closer. You can see some good pictures of the astronauts waving at Andy Thomas, uh, who is um, live television views over as behind the airlock on Mir. Away from the Mir space station, uh, from the vantage point, both of the Mir crew looking this down This undocking has gone very, windows. very well. Joe Edwards, who is at the controls, told me uh, he hoped this docking would have some, uh, some problems because he wanted to prove to everybody he could do a wonderful job no matter how complicated the task was. So we've got two pictures here, John. There, one we, we can see the <laughs> shuttle from Mir, and the other one, of course, is looking back from Endeavour, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, right. One is looking at Mir through the uh, the porthole on the shuttle, and uh, a distance of 140 feet between. The well, two the uh, camera crew on Mir, which um, mm -hmm. I'm guessing is uh, is flight engineer, uh, the flight engineer on Mir is. Uh, well, this is a picture inside Mir. We're going to get to see Andy Thomas's reaction to the shuttle moving away reaches a position about 140 feet below the Mir space station. Uh, and this is a shot. I, Andy Thomas and I talked about this. I said, how are you going to feel when the shuttle backs away? Mm -hmm. to take it away? And he said, I imagine it will be very sad. Station. And again, these um, views both from on board the Mir. I gather they're about 40 meters away now. Yeah, yeah. Yep. From Endeavour, the two vehicles mm -hmm. now 170 feet apart. This is the voice of Eileen Hawley, NASA commentator, who was in Houston, looking at these two pictures as they're transmitted from there. And you can see in the uh, lower right-hand corner of your screen, uh, if you've been paying attention, and I sort of have been looking toward it and away from it, the, uh, the Mir space station getting smaller in that window. <coughs> now, David Wolf is on, uh, is on the shuttle, and he is um, uh, speaking Russian there to his Russian comrades, uh, probably giving them one last goodbye. John, what we're going to do is we're going to leave this for the moment, and of course uh, we'll we'll have our cameras running. So if anything uh, uh, anything else we can see from there, will will be uh, something the viewers can see later on, and we'll get back to you and uh, okay. get a little more on what's happening up there. Excellent in space. undocking. I think the bottom line Basically. is is it went very well. It went right on schedule, and uh, fabulous pictures from space. And a clean launch from Soyuz and a clean yeah. separation from Endeavour. Yeah, Soyuz talks with Mir. 
in a couple of days, and then uh, there'll be six people up there for a while, and it's going to be very crowded then uh, for the next three weeks. All right. John, thanks very much. We're going to get on to uh, uh, our news programs in just a moment. For the viewers in Europe, you'll be seeing Larry King in just a minute. And the rest of you, stay tuned for more news. This has been a CNN Live event. Ein Forschungslabor für den Weltraum. Ausgerüstet für biologische und medizinische Experimente, für Versuche mit neuen Werkstoffen in der Schwerelosigkeit. Vier Astronauten sollen hier schon in wenigen Jahren im Dienste der Wissenschaft arbeiten. Ein Blick in die Zukunft. Das originalgetreue Modell des Forschungsmoduls Columbus bei der DASA in Bremen macht's möglich. Das Weltraumlabor ist der wichtigste europäische Beitrag zur internationalen Raumstation, deren Entwicklung, Betrieb und Ausbau nun vertraglich gesichert ist. 407 Kilometer über unserem Planeten soll sie in nicht allzu ferner Zukunft kreisen. Schon im Jahr 2002 soll das Columbus Raumlabor fest an die Station angedockt werden. Nur ein kleiner Teil des fast 500 Tonnen schweren Hightech-Kolosses, aber für Deutschland ein entscheidender. Bei der DASA in Bremen liegt die Federführung für die Entwicklung von Columbus. 1,4 Milliarden Mark kommen aus dem Forschungsetat, jede Mark mehr geht zu Lasten der DASA. Hier in Bremen sollen große Teile des Raumlabors auch zusammengesetzt werden. Die erste Hardware für die Raumstation traf in diesen Tagen aus Japan ein. Die Vertragsunterzeichnung in Washington schafft die Grundlage für alle weiteren Arbeiten. Mit dieser Rechtsbasis erhält die Industrie eine sehr hohe Planungssicherheit für Strategie, Arbeitsplatzausbau oder Stabilisierung für den Betrieb und die Entwicklung der Raumstation. Rund 1000 Arbeitsplätze sichert der Bau des Weltraumlabors im krisengebeutelten Bremen, bei Zulieferbetrieben und bei der DASA, die die Hansestadt zum bedeutendsten Raumfahrtstandort in Deutschland gemacht hat. Columbus ist aber mehr als ein Wirtschaftsfaktor. Es ist die Eintrittskarte zu wegweisenden Weltraumexperimenten. Geplant ist dafür auch zahlungskräftige Nutzer aus der Privatwirtschaft zu gewinnen. Für den Forschungsminister stand das deutsche Ja zur internationalen Raumstation deshalb nie in Frage. Deutschland ist äh, der größte Technologielieferant Europas, der drittgrößte Technologielieferant in der Welt. Es ist völlig unvorstellbar, dass wir als äh, hochentwickeltes Industrieland uns an dieser großen internationalen Anstrengung nicht beteiligen. Nicht zu unterschätzen auch der politische Aspekt der internationalen Zusammenarbeit in der Raumstation. Beim Blick auf die Erde gibt es keine Grenzen mehr. Stunden soll in Washington der Startschuss für das größte internationale Forschungsprojekt aller Zeiten fallen. 15 Staaten, darunter auch Deutschland, unterzeichnen dann einen Vertrag für die erste internationale Raumstation. Mit dem Bau der rund 200 Milliarden Mark teuren Station soll schon in diesem Sommer begonnen werden. Bis dahin soll die alte Raumstation Mir, wenn möglich, weiter in Betrieb bleiben. Vor einer halben Stunde startete vom russischen Weltraumbahnhof Baikonur eine neue Mannschaft. Die Soyuz-Rakete soll die Station am Samstag erreichen. An Bord ist neben zwei russischen Kosmonauten auch ein französischer Wissenschaftler. Die Crew soll die jetzige Mannschaft ablösen. Zurzeit ist die US-Raumfähre Endeavour noch an die Mir gekoppelt. Sie hatte vor einer Woche Nachschub und einen amerikanischen Astronauten zur Station gebracht. In wenigen Stunden soll die Endeavour wieder ablegen und zur Erde zurückkehren. Als ich vom Weltraumbahnhof Baikonur in Kasachstan eine neue Mannschaft auf den Weg zu mir machte, legte der US-Shuttle Endeavour von der russischen Raumstation nach fünftägigem Rendezvous ab, um zur Erde zurückzukehren. Und auch das Ende der Mir wird heute Abend offiziell besiegelt. Am Abend unterzeichnen 15 Staaten in Washington das Abkommen für den Bau der neuen internationalen Raumstation Alpha. Carsten Schmidt berichtet. Richtung All wird es auch im nächsten Jahrtausend für die Soyuz-Rakete gehen. Doch dann sollen die Kosmonauten nicht wie heute die Mir ansteuern, sondern die neue internationale Raumstation Alpha. In zwei Jahren wird Alpha einsatzbereit sein, die bislang ehrgeizigste Aufgabe im Kosmos für die Menschheit. Voraussichtliche Kosten rund 90 Milliarden Mark. Den Löwenanteil tragen die Amerikaner und Russen. Deutschland zahlt fast die Hälfte des europäischen Beitrags. Bis zum Jahr 2004 rund zweieinhalb Milliarden Mark. Russland wird jetzt die ersten Teile des Mammutprojekts ins All bringen. Im Juni ist der Startschuss. Dann wird der Weltraum fünf Jahre lang zur Großbaustelle. Mehr als 1000 Stunden müssen die Astronauten im freien Weltraum arbeiten. Bislang haben Russen und Amerikaner insgesamt erst 800 Stunden hinter sich. Ist die Alpha einsatzbereit, wird die Mir überflüssig. So war der Abschied zwischen der Besatzung des Shuttles und der Raumstation heute beinahe schon ein historischer. 
Nur noch einmal wird es dieses Rendezvous im All geben. Größer und komfortabler wird die neue, 100 Meter lange Heimat der Astronauten sein. Der traumhafte Blick auf Mutter Erde wird aber der gleiche bleiben, wie von der Mir aus. Das Wort des fliegenden Wechsel wird es im All geben. Vom russischen Raumfahrtzentrum Baikonur aus haben sich neue Besatzungsmitglieder für die Mir auf den Weg gemacht. Gleichzeitig hat die US-Raumfähre Endeavour ihr Rendezvous mit der russischen Raumstation beendet und kehrt zur Erde zurück. Im verwahrlosten, aber immer noch wundersam lebendigen Baikonur standen die Satellitenschüsseln wieder mal mit dem Bauch nach oben, Starttag. 40 Meter hoch ragte die Soyuz-Rakete in den kasachischen Himmel, bereit zum Transport von allerlei Gerät und drei neuen Männern. Pünktlich 19.33 Uhr Moskauer Zeit der Start. 48 Stunden wird die Soyuz fliegen, rotieren. Für die wie Heringe verpackten Männer an Bord eine Tortur. Kommandeur Musabayev, ein Kasache, Bordingenieur Budarin, der einzige Russe diesmal und der französische Wissenschaftler Ejarz. Für runde 60 Millionen Dollar, die Frankreich an Russland zahlt, wird er jetzt unter anderem Salamander züchten und nach drei Wochen mit Salamander Muttis und deren Weltraumnachwuchs zur Erde fliegen. Aber den dreien steht härteres bevor. Oben im Dunkel wartet die Mir und in ihr zieht und zischt es an vielen Enden. Sie sollen das Schiff endlich abdichten. Das Schwerste, es gilt, ein 140 Tonnen schweres Triebwerk der Mir auszuwechseln, eine Knochenarbeit, für die sie wochenlang schwitzend übten. In zwei Tagen werden sie die alte Mir-Besatzung begrüßen. Nur einer ist dann nicht mehr da, der Amerikaner Wolf. Der fliegt gerade jetzt mit der Endeavour zur Erde. Die Geburt des Nachfolgers wird heute Abend noch in Washington mit ein paar feierlichen Unterschriften besiegelt. Startschuss zum größten friedlichen Raumfahrtprojekt in der Geschichte der Menschheit. Die USA und Russland, Europa, Kanada und Japan, alle sind dabei, bauen gemeinsam eine Weltraumstation von wahrlich gigantischem Ausmaß. Kerstin Ehret. Zwei Russen und ein Franzose heute Nachmittag auf dem Weg zum Auslaufmodell der bemannten Raumfahrt der russischen Mir. An der Zukunft wird schon gebaut. Das erste Bauteil für die internationale Raumstation ISS, bis vor kurzem noch Alpha genannt, wird im Juni unbemannt ins All transportiert. Im Juli folgt der erste Bautrupp und 1999 die Forschungscrew. Die Raumstation ist so ausgelegt, dass sie permanent von Astronauten bewohnt wird. Insgesamt werden das sechs Astronauten sein die allerdings die gesamte Raumstation betreiben und vor allen Dingen die Experimente in der Raumstation betreuen. Wie ein Puzzle wird ISS bis zum Jahr 2003 zusammengesetzt und soll dann zehn Jahre in Betrieb sein. 200 Milliarden Mark verschlingt ISS, 160 Milliarden zahlen die USA, Deutschland ist mit zweieinhalb Milliarden Mark dabei. Lohnt sich der Aufwand? Die Begründung ist sowohl die wissenschaftliche Forschung als auch die internationale Bündnispolitik aus der Sicht der Materialforschung ist es weitgehend falsch, weil man mit unbemannten Raumflügen genauso Materialforschung betreiben kann. Andere freuen sich über extreme Experimentierbedingungen in extremen Ausmaßen. Größer als ein Fußballfeld und 470 Tonnen schwer wird ISS die Erde in 460 Kilometern Höhe in eineinhalb Stunden umkreisen. Eine Schlüsselrolle bei diesem Projekt fällt den Russen zu. Doch ihretwegen wurde die ganze Sache schon mal um ein halbes Jahr verschoben. Doch jetzt gibt es weiter Schwierigkeiten in Moskau, Frank Höfling. Ja, in der Tat, die Russen haben wieder einmal Probleme mit ihrem wichtigsten Beitrag zu der internationalen Raumstation. Das sogenannte Service-Modul, das ist so etwas wie das Schlafzimmer für die Astronauten, das sollte eigentlich im Dezember ins All geschossen werden. Dann könnte man zumindest provisorisch auf der neuen Station forschen und auch leben. Doch jetzt wird sich dieses, dieser Start, dieses Service-Modul zumindest ein Vierteljahr, um ein weiteres Vierteljahr verzögern. Der Grund, die Russen haben wieder einmal kein Geld und selbst die wenigen Mittel, die im Staatshaushalt vorgesehen sind, die werden im Augenblick vom russischen Parlament hier in Moskau blockiert. Frank, und wie kommt man da aus der ganzen Sache raus? Ja, da wird man wahrscheinlich wieder so rauskommen, wie das schon mal der Fall war, indem der Westen nämlich einfach den Russen finanziell unter die Arme greift. Entweder indem die Amerikaner neue Mir-Missionen starten oder wie in einem anderen Fall, indem die Amerikaner oder auch die Europäer sich direkt an den russischen Modulen beteiligen. Also insgesamt gesehen ganz clever von den Russen. Naja, der Westen hat ja auch was davon, denn es gibt nicht nur für das Geld dann ein Modul für die Raumstation, sondern gleichzeitig auch sozusagen als Beigabe russische Weltraumtechnologie.
100 Meter lang, fast 500 Tonnen schwer und 100 Milliarden Mark teuer. Mit der Raumstation Alpha wird ein Stück Science-Fiction Wirklichkeit. Wenn alles glatt läuft, wird das schwebende Forschungszentrum in fünf Jahren zusammengeschraubt sein. Die ersten beiden Teile werden Russen und Amerikaner bereits im Sommer in die Umlaufbahn befördern. Europa ist beim Projekt Alpha mit zwölf Staaten vertreten. Allein Deutschland wird für das Unternehmen 2,5 Milliarden Mark hinblättern. Das ist fast die Hälfte des gesamten europäischen Etats. Europa übernimmt neben verschiedenen Forschungsaufgaben auch die Versorgung der Weltraumstation. Ein spezieller Raumtransporter wird regelmäßig Nachschub zur Alpha bringen. Die Inbetriebnahme der Weltraumstation im Jahre 2003 bedeutet gleichzeitig das Ende der Mir. Das russische Pannenlabor wird dann ausgemustert. Bis es soweit ist, wird dort aber weiter geforscht und vor allem weiter repariert. Vor gut drei Stunden startete die neue Besatzung vom Weltraumbahnhof Baikonur in Richtung All. Die alte Crew wird in drei Wochen zur Erde zurückkehren. Soyuz-Rakete vom Raumfahrtzentrum Baikonur in Kasachstan. An Bord ist die neue Besatzung der Raumstation Mir, zwei russische Kosmonauten sowie ein Franzose. Am Samstag soll die Soyuz-Kapsel an der Mir andocken und die alte russische Besatzung nach einem halben Jahr im All ablösen. Hauptaufgabe der neuen Mannschaft sind Reparaturarbeiten sowie die Durchführung wissenschaftlicher Experimente. 16. Juli 1969. Die 100 Meter hohe Rakete Saturn V hebt ab ins All zu einer historischen Mission. An Bord die US-Astronauten Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin und Michael Collins. Die drei sind auf dem Weg zum Mond. Am 20. Juli ist es soweit. Ein kleiner Schritt für den Menschen, aber ein großer für die Menschheit. Raumfahrt in den 60ern und 70ern, immer auch ein Stück Politik, ein Wettrennen zwischen Kapitalismus und Kommunismus. Wir sind entschlossen, in diesem Jahrzehnt den Mond zu betreten, nicht weil es einfach, sondern weil es schwierig ist. Dieses Rennen gewannen die Amerikaner. Acht Jahre zuvor hatten die Russen die Nase vorn und den Westen geschockt. Der Kosmonaut Yuri Gagarin flog 1961 als erster Mensch ins All. Ein Russe, ein Kommunist, betrachtete als erster die Erdkugel von oben. Das größte wissenschaftliche und auch technische Unternehmen, das jemals in internationaler Zusammenarbeit angepackt wurde, nimmt langsam aber sicher Gestalt an. In den Produktionshallen und Laboratorien von 15 Ländern bereiten Ingenieure und Forscher eine internationale Weltraumstation vor, mit deren Aufbau im Sommer begonnen wird. Für den offiziellen Startschuss dieses internationalen Großprojekts namens Alpha oder auch mittlerweile ISS kommen heute hochrangige Vertreter der beteiligten Länder in Washington zusammen. Mit dabei auch Deutschland und zehn weitere europäische Länder. Sie alle beteiligen sich über die ESA an dieser Station. In Washington treffen sich 15 Raumfahrtminister aus aller Welt, um das Abkommen über die internationale Raumstation zu unterzeichnen. Alpha. Eine kostspielige Unterschrift. Rund 100 Milliarden Dollar sind für den Bau veranschlagt. Fast alle raumfahrenden Nationen tragen ihren Teil dazu bei. Die amerikanische NASA, die japanische NASDA, die kanadische CSA, die russische RSA und die europäische ESA. Bis zum Jahre 2002 soll die Station zusammengebaut sein und sogar schon vorher genutzt werden. Wofür ist das? In der Station sollen Wissenschaftler monatelang zusammenleben und forschen. Neue Medikamente und Materialien, die in der Schwerelosigkeit entwickelt werden. Aber die bemannte Raumfahrt ist auch Prestigeobjekt. Alpha sichert die Führungsposition der USA auf dem Gebiet der Weltraumtechnik. Die Einbeziehung der Russen macht diese zum sogenannten Juniorpartner. Raumfahrtprogramme sind teuer. Geld, das den Russen derzeit fehlt. Europa beteiligt sich aus außen- und wirtschaftspolitischen Gründen. Allein können sie mit den USA nicht konkurrieren. Ein ehrgeiziges Projekt. Doch der Teufel steckt im Detail. Erst wenn alle Kabel richtig gesteckt sind, kann aus Science Fiction Wirklichkeit werden. Unser Studiogast heute Abend gehört wahrlich zu den Pionieren in der Weltraumforschung. Professor Hans-Hermann Kölle ist gekommen. 
wenn Sie sich dieses Alpha-Projekt angucken. Wie schätzen Sie das ein? Was halten Sie davon? Insgesamt ist das sicherlich ein gewaltiger Schritt voran. Und zwar für das nächste Jahrhundert müssen wir das im Zusammenhang sehen mit dem, was danach kommen wird. Denn wir müssen lernen, im Weltraum zu arbeiten und zu leben. Denn ohne die moderne Technik wird die Menschheit es schwer haben, über das nächste Jahrtausend zu kommen. Und insofern ist dieses ein sehr wichtiger Schritt. Hätten Sie sich das, ich will nicht sagen zu Ihrer Zeit, aber vielleicht vor einigen Jahrzehnten zu Beginn dieser gesamten Weltraumforschung überhaupt vorstellen können, dass es tatsächlich mal so ein Baukastensystem im All geben könnte? Doch, das haben wir schon vor etwa 40 Jahren in ersten Entwürfen uns so vorgestellt. Natürlich sieht es jetzt heute etwas anders aus als ursprünglich vorgesehen. Aber der Schritt äh, zur Raumstation war seit 1923, seit Hermann Obert seine Theorie der Raumfahrt entwickelt hat, an für sich vorgezeichnet. Und stellt sich der Otto Normalverbraucher oder wir Steuerzahler vielleicht alle immer wieder die Frage, was kommt eigentlich an sichtbaren Ergebnissen raus, so sehr uns diese Bilder faszinieren? Wo spiegeln sich irgendwelche Ergebnisse wider? Das Eigenartige ist, dass man die Grundlagenforschung im Prinzip begrüßt. Nur in der Weltraumforschung will man gleich das Geld wieder zurückhaben. Und das funktioniert nicht. Aber wenn wir daran denken, dass ohne die moderne Raketentechnik auch keine Satelliten geben würde, würden wir auch keine Nachrichtensatelliten haben und wir würden keine direkte Übertragung äh, haben, die heute äh, unser tägliches Brot sind. Insofern gibt es zahlreiche äh, Dinge, die wir heute schon erkennen können, auch im täglichen Nutzen, sei es die Wetterberichte, die besser geworden sind, so glaubt man manchmal, äh, aber auch Navigationssatelliten sind sehr vielversprechend, dass man auf Meter genau weiß, wo man ist, selbst wenn man sich verirrt hat im Wald. Alles diese sind Dinge, die äh, kommen oder schon da sind und ohne die Raumfahrttechnik nicht machbar sind. Nun äh, hat John Glenn vor, mit über 70 Jahren nochmal ins All zu fliegen. Wie schätzen Sie das denn ein? Halten Sie das für eine sinnvolle Idee? Ich kenne John Glenn persönlich aus seinen ersten Jahren als Astronaut. Ich hatte das Vergnügen, ihm die Grundzüge der Raketentechnik in Huntsville beizubringen. Und äh, für mich ist das ein Beweis, dass eben nicht nur Spitzensportler in den Weltraum können, sondern auch normale Menschen, wenn das so läuft, wie es gedacht ist. Das kann von großer Bedeutung werden, weil wir damit rechnen, dass in 20, 30 Jahren der Weltraumtourismus beginnen wird und das dann für alle Menschen die Chance ist, die Erde, die Erde von oben zu sehen. Sie haben am Anfang schon einmal gesagt, wie wichtig Sie die Weltraumforschung auch für das nächste Jahrhundert halten. Wir haben nun diesen Kalten Krieg miterlebt. Denken Sie, dass nun der gemeinsame Weg im All so eine Art Weltfrieden bestimmen und machen kann? Ja, sicher. Schon Eugen Sänger, einer der bekanntesten deutschen Raumfahrtpioniere, hat gesagt, die Raumfahrt ist der Satz des Krieges. Und ich glaube, er hat recht, weil ja die Menschen lernen über ihren Gartenzaun zu sehen, auch dass andere Menschen auf diesem Globus existieren und vom Mond her gesehen sieht man auf der Erde auch keine Grenzen mehr. Insofern meine ich doch, dass die Chancen, große Kriege auf diesem Planeten noch zu erleben, praktisch gegen Null gehen, umso weiter wir in den Weltraum hinauskommen. Wollen wir hoffen, dass es tatsächlich so zutrifft. Vielen herzlichen Dank für den Besuch bei uns im Studio. Nach dem Zusammenbruch des Sowjetreiches waren auch die finanziellen Mittel für die aufwendigen Raumprojekte erschöpft. Und mit Unterstützung ausländischer Investoren lassen sich heute noch Missionen im All finanzieren. Heute liefen die letzten Vorbereitungen für den fliegenden Wechsel in der russischen Raumstation Mir. Vom Weltraumzentrum Baikonur aus machten sich die neue russische Besatzung und ein französischer Kosmonaut bereit für den Start einer Soyuz-Rakete. Kronichev, ein ehemals geschlossener Betrieb von der Größe einer Kleinstadt. Knapp anderthalb Jahre haben hier Russen mit amerikanischem Geld den Basisblock für die internationale Raumstation Alpha entwickelt und gebaut, das Modul FGB. 20 Tonnen schwer und über 200 Millionen Dollar teuer. 
Vor zehn Tagen wurde es vorgestellt. Mit dabei eine amerikanische Endeavour Crew, die den Basisblock im Juni mit einem NASA-Modul verkoppeln und damit den Grundstein für Alpha legen wird. Im nächsten Januar dann soll die erste reguläre Besatzung zur Alpha aufbrechen, zwei Russen und ein Amerikaner. Der erste Schritt zur Ablösung der pannengeplagten Raumstation Mir, in der im letzten Jahr mehr repariert als geforscht wurde. Natürlich hat dies dazu geführt, dass eine ganze Reihe von Experimenten abgesagt werden musste, erklärt ein Mitarbeiter des Raumfahrtzentrums. Und das alles hat sich logischerweise auch negativ auf das Image der russischen Raumfahrt ausgewirkt. Dennoch, im Augenblick sei die Station noch unverzichtbar, beschwören sowohl Russen als auch Amerikaner, die gerade einen neuen Astronauten an Bord gebracht haben. Und wenn es sein muss, so alt Kosmonaut Vitali Sevastianov, können sie noch fünf Jahre durchhalten. Doch das soll sie gar nicht. Spätestens 1999 soll sie außer Dienst gestellt werden. Das setzt aber voraus, dass die Zeitpläne eingehalten werden. Und wenn das Geld ausgeht, hilft auch Improvisieren nicht mehr. Die Khrunichev Crew kann ein Lied davon singen. Nach dem Basisblock sollte eigentlich auch das zweite russische Modul schon fertig sein. Dies kommt nun aber erst im April. Ja, wir liegen zurück und wir haben Probleme. Aber Präsident Jelzin hat sich jetzt dieser Frage persönlich angenommen und Entscheidungen getroffen, dass Russland seinen Verpflichtungen auch in Zukunft nachkommen wird. Der Traum vom Fliegen hat in der amerikanischen Hauptstadt einen Schauraum, der weltweit seinesgleichen sucht, das National Air and Space Museum. Tragfläche an Tragfläche oder ganz flüglos machen sich hier hunderte berühmte und berüchtigte Flugobjekte den Luftraum streitig. Besucher treffen bei ihrem Rundgang durch die Geschichte der Welt, der Luft- und Raumfahrt auf viele Bekannte. Wie die Gebrüder Weid, denen nach waghalsigen Flugmanövern der Durchbruch in die moderne Fliegerei glückte, oder Neil Armstrong bei seinem ersten Mondspaziergang. Dieses Museum ist fast wie ein Tempel, eine Kirche, denn die Menschen hier glauben fest an das, was die Luft- und Raumfahrt für dieses Land getan haben. Seit seinem Bau von 20 Jahren ist das Air Space Museum das Highlight der Washingtoner Museumsmeile am Fuß des Kapitols. Acht Millionen Besucher, mehr als in irgendeinem anderen Museum der Welt, drängeln sich jährlich durch die Luft- und Raumfahrtschau. Egal ob Doppeldecker oder Düsenjet, alle Ausstellungsstücke, darunter unzählige Originale, hängen und stehen zum Greifen nah. Und viele können sogar angefasst werden wie dieses Stück Mondgestein. Im Glanz der Attraktion bleibt so manches dunkle Luftfahrtkapitel unaufgeschlagen. Die Galerien der Weltkriege schwärmen von tollkühnen Helden in ihren fliegenden Kisten. Für die unzähligen Opfer ist kaum Platz. Zu dem Publikumsmagneten gehört der Bomber in Nola G., dessen Atomangriff auf Hiroshima beendete für Amerika zwar den Zweiten Weltkrieg, über die Folgen der Bombe berichten jedoch nur wenige Zeitungsausschnitte. Von den Kriegen der Nationen zum Wettlauf im All. Ein großer Schritt für die Menschheit, aber nur wenige Schritte für Museumsbesucher. In der Weltraumhalle erzählen Raketen und Raumstationen von Reisen ins Orbit und Spaziergängen in Schwerelosigkeit. Die Zuschauer sind begeistert. Das war es offensichtlich nicht. Noch eine kleine technische Panne zum Abschluss. Soll nicht wieder vorkommen. Wir versprechen es. Morgen haben wir eine neue Chance, neues Spiel, neues Glück. The Space Shuttle heads for home and a Frenchman heads for Mir. We'll talk about the future of space exploration with the French science minister just ahead on World News from Washington. In this view from Endeavour looking back to... Lots of comings and goings involving the Russian Mir space station on Thursday. Less than four hours ago, the U.S. space shuttle Endeavour separated from Mir. The shuttle is bringing home U.S. astronaut David Wolfe. He was replaced by Andy Thomas, the last American scheduled to work on Mir. The shuttle is due to land at Kennedy Space Center on Saturday. About 20 minutes before the shuttle left Mir, a Russian Soyuz spacecraft lifted off from Kazakhstan. The Soyuz is bringing two Russian cosmonauts and a French astronaut up to Mir. And less than an hour from now, representatives of 15 nations are scheduled here in Washington to sign an agreement to cooperate in building and running a new space station. France will be represented by Claude Allegre, Minister of Science and Technology, who joins us now in Washington. 
So you're signing the agreement along with the other nations, yeah. uh, along with side agreements with Russia and some other countries participating yeah. in this space, uh, the new space station. Is the idea of a new space station a good one? Well, I think it's a fantastic technical performance, and I think uh, in this sense it's a good idea. But as you know, uh, my personal opinion is uh, at the moment, uh, the trend is not going to have an uh, astronaut and cosmonaut. I, I prefer to have a handman's uh, mission with a more technological and scientific return than to spend uh, most of the techniques and money just for the main uh, mission. Now let me understand this. You are signing an agreement that says your country and yeah, the United the, States and several others are ready to spend a lot of money to build yeah, a but, manned space station yeah, in outer and space. I said, and I said I don't like the manned space station. But the point is the wording of France is indisputable. It has been agreed before we came in power and the, the I don't want to have any doubt for uh, uh, the partnership of uh, France. So you support it and you're willing to spend the money on it, but you just don't think it's the right way to go in, Absolutely. in outer space. So what do you think of sending John Glenn uh, back into space to explore the idea of uh, aging in space? I don't know. I think he's an, uh, he's an am for me, he's an amazing uh, f uh, ID. I don't think he's an, uh, uh, big thing for science and technology, which is my main concern. Why do you think that an unmanned mission to space and unmanned missions to planets, for example, are more productive and more useful than oh, manned missions? Oh, well, it's a fantastic. It's a, you, can do, you can do observation, detailed observation, uh, co telecommunication, uh, you can return sample from the planet, you can do everything. And in this bank, you develop for the industry the robotics, the informatics, the telecommunication, and so forth. It's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic return. When you have a main sample, most of the pellet is used to maintain the life of the people and is legitimate. So I think the main uh, uh, mission were a good idea 20 years ago. But the technology have been so fast and so powerful now that we can do with the modern technology many, many, many things. Got to ask you one more quick question. So you, you would prefer not to see a manned mission, but let the U.S. go ahead anyway and do its manned missions? Oh, if U.S. want to do, this is not my business. But, but we want to cooperate with U.S. For example, we had this fantastic mission, uh, French-U.S. in Topex Poseidon to observe the ocean where we understand the El Nino thing and so forth. It's a fantastic mission. It was a handman's mission, but he has a fantastic return. So I'm glad to be here, and he's also a sign of the friendship in space between France and U.S. All right. U.S., uh, I'm sorry, French Minister of Science and Technology, Claude Allegra, thank you very much for being with us on thank World News from Washington. You. And that is all for this edition of our program. Thank you for joining us. I'm Ralph Begletter. Zur Stunde die Geburtsstunde für die künftige internationale Weltraumstation ISS. 15 Länder, darunter auch Deutschland, werden die Paten dieses Weltraumlabors sein. Billig wird das Kind nicht werden. Forschungsminister Rüttger stellt aus seinem Etat rund zweieinhalb Milliarden Mark dafür bereit. Thomas Schor. Die internationale Raumstation wird das größte Projekt der Weltraumgeschichte. 108 Meter lang, 74 Meter breit, mehr als ein Fußballfeld am Lebensraum für sieben Astronauten. Die USA und Russland werden die Kernelemente der neuen Orbitalstation bauen. Aus Japan und Europa kommen zwei Forschungsmodule. Kanada stellt den Robotikarm. Endlich wieder Hochkonjunktur in der bemannten Raumfahrt. Wunderbar. Auf diesen Tag haben wir lange gewartet. Denken Sie daran, seit 1987 warten wir auf die Raumstation. Damals gab es die ersten Pläne nur die Amerikaner mit der ESA. Heute sind die Russen dabei. Heute ist es eine wirklich internationale Raumstation, an der wirklich fast alle Länder der Erde teilnehmen. Ein großartiger Tag. Im Spätsommer beginnen die ersten Transporte ins All. Weltweit laufen bereits die Vorbereitungen in der Industrie und in den Instituten. Robotik, Medizin, Werkstoffe, Telekommunikation. Sie sind die ersten Anwärter auf Fortschritt und Profit aus dem All. Knapp 200 Milliarden Mark wird die neue Arbeitsplattform im All kosten. Die Europäer übernehmen davon trotz ihrer Wirtschaftskraft nur knapp 6 Prozent. 
Die Europäische Raumfahrtagentur ESA soll aus Kostengründen die Hälfte ihres Forschungsmoduls bereits den Amerikanern überschrieben haben. Entsprechend bescheiden werden die Nutzungsmöglichkeiten für die Europäer sein. Ein Kleinmut, der korrigiert werden sollte, denn diese Station wird einmal die Basis für den bemannten Aufbruch zum Mars mit all seinen faszinierenden Möglichkeiten sein. A new crew is en route to the Russian space station Mir. The Russian Soyuz rocket lifted off on Thursday, carrying two Russian cosmonauts and a French astronaut. The cosmonauts will live on Mir for the next six months, but the Frenchman, he'll stay only a few weeks. The Soyuz rocket is scheduled to dock with Mir on Saturday. The new crew will join a US astronaut who arrived at the station just last week on board the US shuttle Endeavour. Endeavour pulled away from Mir and began a return flight to Earth shortly after the Russian rocket blasted off. US astronaut David Wolf, who spent four months on Mir, is now on his way back home. Vor wenigen Minuten wurde in Washington der Vertrag über die Errichtung der internationalen Raumstation unterschrieben. Darin wird nicht nur geregelt, wer was baut und da oben schafft, sondern auch, wer was auf der Raumstation forschen darf oder aber nicht. Deutschland wird als Mitglied der Europäischen Weltraumbehörde, ESA, fast die Hälfte des europäischen Teils zahlen und bauen. Thomas Schor berichtet. Das größte Projekt der Weltraumgeschichte, die neue Orbitalstation, ist 108 Meter lang, 74 Meter breit, größer als ein Fußballfeld und bietet Platz für sieben Astronauten. Der neue Aufbruch ins All ist teuer, riskant, aber auch spannend und möglicherweise sehr profitabel. Denn es geht um Schlüsseltechnologien des nächsten Jahrtausends. Robotik, Medizin, Werkstoffe, Telekommunikation. Viel neues Wissen, neue Produkte. Sie könnten erstmals in langen Untersuchungsreihen getestet werden. Stoff für Astronautenträume. Wunderbar. Auf diesen Tag haben wir lange gewartet. Denken Sie daran, seit 1987 warten wir auf die Raumstation. Damals gab es die ersten Pläne nur die Amerikaner mit der ESA. Heute sind die Russen dabei. Heute ist es eine wirklich internationale Raumstation, an der wirklich fast alle Länder der Erde teilnehmen. Ein großartiger Tag. Die internationale Arbeitsteilung funktioniert bereits hervorragend, so zum Beispiel zwischen Deutschen und Japanern. In Bremen sind heute die ersten Komponenten übergeben worden, die schon bald auf der Raumstation gebraucht werden. Experimentschränke. Im Modell existiert bereits das Labor, das auch die europäische Forschung weiterbringen soll. An ihm zeigt sich, Kleinmut rächt sich. Die Europäer beteiligen sich nur zu rund 6 Prozent an den Baukosten von rund 100 Milliarden Dollar. Entsprechend bescheiden werden die Forschungsmöglichkeiten aussehen. Schauen Sie sich allein die Columbus Orbiting Facility, das ist also der europäische Beitrag, die Tonne, wo wissenschaftliche Arbeit geleistet wird, an. Die soll ganz zum Schluss erst im Jahre 2003 angedockt werden, sozusagen wirklich als letztes. Die Europäer haben leider schon die Hälfte dieser Tonne an die Amerikaner ver verkauft. Das heißt, uns gehört eigentlich gar nicht mehr die Tonne. Wenn das die ESA wenigstens wieder rückgängig machen könnte, dass man sagen könnte von hier unten, das ist Europa, das ist unser Beitrag, das wäre schön. Viel Arbeit wartet auf die Ariane 5, Europas neuer Lastenträger, ins All. Von den 47 Flügen auf die neue Baustelle in 400 Kilometern Höhe soll sie einige übernehmen. Da die Ariane aber nicht selbst andocken kann, braucht sie dafür ein eigenes Trägerfahrzeug. Es soll den Partnern der internationalen Arbeitsgemeinschaft noch als Rettungskapsel schmackhaft gemacht werden. Keine leichte Aufgabe, denn grundsätzlich ist jedes Teilnehmerland berechtigt, seinen Fuhrpark anteilig einzusetzen. In Deutschland sichert die neue Raumstation rund 1700 Arbeitsplätze. Weitaus mehr werden es sein, wenn neben der Wissenschaft auch die Industrie die neue Station mit kommerziellen Aufgaben betraut. We undocked and this view is from the payload bay, from one of the payload bay cameras. You can see the two docking adapters separating there. And then the next scene is the view that we had from the orbiter through our centerline camera and through the overhead window. You can see the docking target there that we use to align the vehicles during docking and during undocking. It looks nice and peaceful in those pictures, but it's a flurry of activity on the flight deck as we take a look at the attitude of mirror and the attitude of the orbiter position and uh, adjust the relative velocity between the vehicles. You can see the view here that the mirror crew had as we separated. As we backed away from Mir, we moved to a position about 240 feet below them so that we could fly around the Mir to do a photographic survey, taking still photography and the video that you see here. 
and as beautiful as this scene is, it frankly just doesn't compare with the view that we had there looking out the overhead window seeing uh, this beautiful spacecraft uh, slicing through the horizon of the Earth as we flew around it. On the right side of this picture, you can see the perota, or the uh, spectre module, which is the module that was damaged in the collision. You can't quite see the damage to the solar ray in this view, but in the next view, I believe you can. You can see the Soyuz spacecraft at the bottom of the node there, the black and gray uh, spacecraft that's uh, docked to Mir and used by the cosmonauts to, uh, to rendezvous and dock for uh, entry. And in the case of an emergency escape, <coughs> It's comforting to know it's there. As we continued our fly around through our last 90 degrees or so, this is the picture that you would have seen from Mir had you been there with us. And we're prepared to uh, do our separation burn to move away from Mir, uh, enter a different orbit, and uh, do continue our preparations for coming home. In this view in the middle, you can see the, uh, in the middle of the spacecraft, the space station, you can see the node. And uh, above that is the perota module, and below that is the uh, Crystal and the docking module in orange down below it. To the left of the node is Kavant 2, and to the right of the node is the Spectre module. And if you look from left to right, the first array that you see on top there is a array that was damaged in the collision. And uh, the last view here is from Mir as we uh, burn to enter a new orbit, and you can actually see the, uh, or could see the lights of uh, cities below the Earth in the picture. As big as that looks, our new International Space Station will be three times as much volume inside and increase our science productivity. After we left the mirror, it was back to science. This is a Canadian-built experiment called Orbiter Space Vision System. We're going to use this to build the International Space Station. It actually uses the orbiter's cameras, sort of like electronic eyes, to help us determine the exact position and orientation of grappled payloads. We carried four gas cans or getaway specials on board two from Germany, one from the University of Michigan, and one from the Chinese Academy of Science. This is how you take your weight in space. This device takes advantage of Newton's second law of motion, actually allows an astronaut to measure his mass. It's going to be important for long duration spaceflight members who want to keep a close track of their health and fitness. You know, I lost 20 pounds. <laughs> we don't know why exactly. This is another experiment that we flew up there called Cebus. This was a closed aquatic ecosystem. And board this aquarium, we had over 200 sword tail fish, a variety of snails, and aquatic plant life. Here's Salajan taking a few brief moments to look at the Earth out of one of the many viewports. We have to use our time real wisely up there. Nine days without gravity takes a toll on your legs, so it's important for us to exercise, keep in shape. The shuttle provides a great platform to uh, view the Earth. Here you see Terry using some of our cameras to take some pictures of the Earth below. We have a lot of computers on board the uh, shuttle, and we use them for a variety of things. Here you see Joe typing out an email message to his wife back home. He's actually on the ceiling of the orbiter while he does this. And first time space flyers just cannot resist playing with their food. Here you see Joe using a bunch of M&Ms to simulate the expansion of the universe. Strawberry drink can be used to demonstrate some pretty advanced principles of fluid physics. You know, in the absence of gravity, surface tension alone is enough to keep a fluid in a perfect sphere. If you blow on it, you can cause it to wiggle, but it still stays together pretty nice and neatly there. Of course, the best part about an experiment like this is when you're all done, you can actually drink it. Uh, rocket is preparing to dock with a space station, as you see here in your live pictures. Uh, these coming uh, from uh, the Mir space station, well, there you actually see mission control, but uh, coming from the Mir station is it is over uh, the coast of Africa. The rocket is delivering uh, to the Mir a French astronaut who's going to stay on board for a few weeks. Also on board, a new crew of cosmonauts who will remain in space for about six months. They'll join U.S. astronaut Andrew Thomas, who recently arrived on board the U.S. shuttle Endeavour. The Endeavour is expected to touch down in the U.S. about five hours from now. Astronaut David Wolf returns to Earth on Endeavour after spending four months and uh, back here to live pictures now.
getting very close here as we go into the docking procedure between the Soyuz rocket and the Mir space station. We should see a bump here any second now. There we have it. We don't expect to see any other activity in terms of opening a hatch or something for, well, more than an hour now. It looks like this uh, mission, this docking has gone well. Of course, it was another docking procedure that caused so much damage to Mir earlier. Russian officials, probably with some good reason, uh, elated that uh, this docking has gone off well. We've lost the picture there, but that was uh, the uh, Mir docking with its uh, Soyuz rocket uh, there over the uh, coast of Africa. Uh, live pictures of that event taking place out in space. An Bord der Soyuz ist die neue Besatzung und ein französischer Astronaut. Die beiden Kosmonauten sollen die russische Crew ablösen, die seit einem halben Jahr auf der Raumstation Mir arbeitet. Nach ihrem Rendezvous mit der russischen Raumstation Mir auf die Erde zurück. Noch etwa dreieinhalb Stunden, dann soll sie im Raumfahrtzentrum Cape Canaveral in Florida landen. Sieben Astronauten, darunter auch David Wolf, der seit September auf der Mir gearbeitet hatte, werden wieder festen Boden unter den Füßen haben. Neun Tage dauerte die Mission der US-Raumfähre Endeavour. Jetzt geht's zurück in Richtung Erde. Die siebenköpfige Mannschaft hat bereits gepackt. Letzte Vorbereitungen auch im Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas. Läuft alles wie geplant, dann landet die Endeavour um 23.35 Uhr unserer Zeit. Fünf Tage seines Fluges war das Shuttle an die russische Raumstation Mir gekoppelt. An Bord drei Tonnen Material für den maroden Weltraumbahnhof sowie der US-Astronaut Andrew Thomas, der seinen Kollegen David Wolf nach 119 Tagen im All ablöste. Der wird nach vier Monaten in der Schwerelosigkeit erstmals wieder sein eigenes Körpergewicht spüren und das am liebsten unter der Dusche. Die Mir dümpelte übrigens nicht lange allein im Orbit umher. Schon heute Abend erhielt sie erneut Besuch, und zwar von der am Donnerstag gestarteten russischen Raumfähre Soyuz mit drei Kosmonauten an Bord. Die Raumstation Mir an und in Florida landet kurz vor Mitternacht die US-Raumfähre Endeavour und bringt sieben Raumfahrer hoffentlich gesund zurück zur Erde. Mission erfüllt. Nach neun Tagen im All landet die amerikanische Raumfähre Endeavour kurz vor Mitternacht in Cape Canaveral. Mit ihr kehren sieben Erdenbürger zurück zu ihrem Planeten. Unter ihnen ein russischer Kosmonaut und der Amerikaner Dave Wolf. Er hatte 119 Tage lang auf der russischen Raumstation Mir gearbeitet. Nun freut er sich auf die erste heiße Dusche und die will er richtig genießen. Die Endeavour hatte Nachschub gebracht für die von Pannen geplagte Mir. Nicht nur rund drei Tonnen Material, sondern auch die Ablösung für Wolf, den US-Astronauten Thomas. Am Donnerstag die Abkopplung von der russischen Raumstation. Die Rückreise zum blauen Planeten beginnt. Gleichzeitig im kasachischen Baikonur. Start einer russischen Soyuz-Rakete. An Bord die Ablösung für zwei der russischen Mir-Kosmonauten. Der neue Kommandant Moussa Bayev, Bordingenieur Budarin und der Franzose Eya. Die einen kommen, die anderen gehen. Inzwischen fast Routine im Weltall.
Well, the crew of the Russian space station Mir is welcoming some new members on board. Docking between Mir and Soyuz space capsule and the Soyuz space yeah. capsule was both flawless and ahead of schedule. It was done on automatic pilot. That's a procedure that has been problematic in past dockings. A short time ago, hatches between Mir and Soyuz opened up, allowing two cosmonauts and a French astronaut to enter the space station. U.S. astronaut Andrew Thomas arrived there on board Mir last week. Well, the space shuttle Endeavour is expected to land in Florida about two hours from now. U.S. space officials say there is going to be clear skies and good weather for this landing. Astronaut David Wolf is returning home from his four-month stint aboard the Russian space station Mir. Researchers are going to be examining Wolf to gather effects, uh, gather data rather, on the effects of weightlessness on the human body. The Raumstation Mir has its landing place in all. Erreicht. Kurz zuvor hatten der Franzose und die beiden Russen mit einer Raumkapsel problemlos an der Mir angedockt. Im Gepäck hatten sie irdische Souvenirs für die alte Crew. Das neue Team soll die Reparaturarbeiten an der Mir abschließen und verschiedene Experimente durchführen. Die russische Raumkapsel Mir Soyuz hat planmäßig an die Weltraumstation Mir angedockt. Die Mir-Besatzung begrüßte die Neuankömmlinge, zwei russische Kosmonauten und einen französischen Wissenschaftler. Damit befinden sich jetzt sechs Raumfahrer auf der Station. Die russische, amerikanische und französische Flagge symbolisieren die an Bord vertretenen Nationalitäten. In der Raumstation Mir. Der neue Kommandant Musabayev, Bordingenieur Budarin und der Franzose Eyart sind am Abend mit der Raumkapsel Soyuz angekommen. Das Undock-Manöver per Computer klappte reibungslos, 20 Minuten früher als geplant. Die sechs Männer werden drei Wochen zusammen in der Mir sein. Sie sollen die Reparaturarbeiten abschließen, die nach einem Unfall im vergangenen Jahr nötig wurden und wissenschaftliche Versuche vornehmen. The Space Shuttle Endeavour is expected to land in Florida in about a half an hour. Clear skies and good weather appear to be holding for the landing. Astronaut David Wolf is returning home from a four-month stint on the Russian space station Mir. Space researchers will examine Wolf to gather data on the effects of weightlessness on the body. CNN plans live coverage of Wolfley's and the shuttle's return. following is CNN's coverage of a live event. Welcome back. I'm Rena Colby at the CNN Center in Atlanta. We are waiting for two live events and we'll try to bring them both to you as they happen. First, the U.S. Space Shuttle Endeavour is about to land at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The shuttle is bringing home United States astronaut David Wolf, who was aboard the Russian space station Mir for four months. And we are also waiting comments from U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, who has just wrapped up meetings with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. She is in the midst of a mission with a double goal. In Israel, she has tried to convince Mr. Netanyahu to agree to a sizable and credible withdrawal from the West Bank. Albright also hopes to line up support for possible military action against Kuwait. And first, we'll go to live coverage of the shuttle, and we will listen in to Master Control at the Kennedy Space Center. So here we're seeing uh, the shuttle coming down, and after four long months on Mir, an ecstatic David Wolf has prepared to return to Earth on Saturday aboard the Space Shuttle Endeavour. His mother was counting down the hours until the sunset landing, and she said he looks so good up there, I know he's bouncing around and doing somersaults. But she says, I can tell, I can tell that he's ready to come back to a somewhat normal life, and remember, normal for David isn't normal for most people. And indeed, the 41-year-old astronaut, who also happens to be a doctor and aerobatic pilot, Pilot seemed to enjoy his 128-day mission, that is four-month mission, despite the isolation and occasionally sweltering temperatures. He's looking forward to all that awaits him back on Earth, including pepperoni and mushroom pizza, a cold drink, a hot shower, and his girlfriend and family. But he will have to wait to taste his mother's specialty, which he says he missed out on Thanksgiving. And he says, I really couldn't fly down there down here with sweet potato casserole. Uh, Mrs. Wolf was laughing about that. Unable to greet Wolf personally, NASA Administrator Daniel Golden made sure the Kennedy Space Center chef had a pizza ready to go. Golden has also arranged for long stemmed roses for the astronauts, mother, stepmother, and girlfriend. Altogether, all uh, David will be met by 30 relatives and family friends who have flown in from Indianapolis for his homecoming. And Wolf, who rocketed away September 25th amid loud concern over mere safety, was replaced last weekend 
by American astronaut Andrew Thomas, the seventh and final American to live on Russia's aging space station. Thomas and his two Russian crewmates were joined Saturday by three more men who arrived in a Soyuz capsule. The cosmonauts will swap places, leaving Thomas and a fresh Russian crew aboard Mir until the end of May. Then it will be time for Thomas to leave and for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration to close out the shuttle Mir program and begin building an international space station. And here it looks like they're making their final approach. A lot of, a lot of pilots would recognize that. They're coming in. We're about two minutes away from Endeavor, the Endeavor, Endeavor, Endeavor landing. And here we hear Master Control Endeavor, Kennedy Space Center. Tonight. You're listening to Mission Control. And uh, as he will be landing, the sound barrier is about to be broken. First broken by Chuck Yeager. Broken again today. Yeah, got a good runway. Looks good, man. Guidance shows she's slightly high. Endeavour now on final approach to runway 15. The commander is saying he sees the runway. On and in a couple of seconds, line. we'll see the wheels come down. Thank you, Susan. We have the field sign. Roger. Runway in sight. Endeavour is descending at an angle six times steeper than that of a commercial airliner on its final approach. Al altitude now, 3,400 3, feet. And they're beginning to feel to gravity for the first seconds. time in 10 days. And like the five previous Americans who lived on Mir, Wolf is facing days of intensive medical test. First view of the ground here as they're just about to land. Landing gear coming down. The wheels are coming down. Landing gear down and locked. And another gear touchdown. beautiful touchdown for Shuttle Endeavour. A very happy crew deployed. Aboard. Nose wheel touchdown. Endeavour now rolling out on one with one five at Kennedy Space Center at the end of a nine day, 3.6 million mile journey, bringing home astronaut Dave Wolf from his four month stay in space. Okay, now when Mr. Wolf uh, will be coming out, he faces days of intensive medical tests, as I said earlier, and weeks of rehabilitation. His bones and muscles are weakened in weightlessness, and his immune system and sense of balance have been altered by all that time in space. And even though he'd much rather walk, Wolf has agreed to be carried off Endeavour on a stretcher. Roger, we'll stop Endeavour. Welcome home. Congratulations on a perfect mission to Mir. And Dave, welcome back from 128 days on orbit. And I wasn't counting, but is that what it was? It'll be a pleasure to see you, Susan. Thanks to everybody. This feels great. And Endeavor Houston, for the CDR, we'd like you to work on page 5-8, ammonia activation. Copy 5-8, ammonia activation. And these are the first words from astronaut David Wolf back on Earth after 128 days in space. It feels like you're having a little gravity storm down here. Currently, they're about to Endeavor Houston, we're watching. blow ammonia through the rockets. And Houston, we've got the right out temp and high and ammonia B secondary on. Okay. 
And doctors uh, are saying that they prefer that the astronauts returning from Mia remain horizontal for as long as possible uh, to allow them the, the possibility for as long as possible to slow the effects of gravity and thus provide better medical data. And uh, they wanted, um, they've actually wanted to attend a beach party being thrown by his family Saturday night. Coincidentally, it is the 30th, 40th anniversary of the launch of America's first satellite, Explorer 1. But David Volt's mother doubted that NASA would allow that. In fact, that is the case. And as they're saying now, more than ever, David Wolf belongs to the world. And we'll be back with uh, Madeline Albright and her news conference. And now we go to World Sport. Thanks for watching. This has been a CNN Live event. But when we were finished with all the science, we put everything away and closed up the space hab and prepared to come home. Just like when we went up there, we opened up the payload bay doors. Now it's time to close the payload bay doors, get our final good view of the Earth below, and get ready to say goodbye. You know, we sort of do this with mixed emotions. We're kind of sad to go home and, and leave space. We've had a really wonderful mission, had a great time up there, and really enjoyed doing what we did. But at the same time, I think everyone was sort of eager to get home and share this experience with their family and friends and their loved ones and really tell them what it was like up there in space. This is a view over my right shoulder in the commander seat during entry. You can see the earth down below us out to the left windows. Uh, we go from 25 times the speed of sound, or about 17,500 miles an hour, down to a landing speed of around 230 miles an hour. Uh, we usually overfly the landing runway and then uh, descend in a left turn down to line up with the runway to touch down. Our descent path is about uh, six times steeper than a commercial airliner's. And again, we're decelerating uh, the entire direction. Here we are in the left turn down at the Kennedy Space Center. About to roll out on final, doing about 300 knots. And you'll see the heads up view here in just a moment. Yeah, here's a view out the pilot's window. And it gives you all your descent, uh, glide path, your airspeed, your altitude. We're doing almost 300 uh, knots, going through 11,000 feet. And you can see the runway overlay. Well, this view really gives you an appreciation of how quickly we're descending. And about 2,000 feet, we pick up the nose of the orbiter to ease the descent rate. The pilot Joe put the gear down at 300 feet. It's about 15 seconds prior to touchdown. View out the back. If you look carefully, you can see some of the smoke from the tires get caught up in the wingtip vortices. Touchdown's around 210 miles an hour. Chute gets deployed at about 200. Even though the runway is over three miles long, it's, it's nice to have something like that drag chute to help bring you to a stop. You continue to roll out, and then you'll see in jettison the, the chute at about 70 miles an hour. And then we that continue. hatch was open. The smell of that grass was almost overwhelming after four and a half months of processed <laughs> air. <laughs> And then after Air 138 wheel. orbits and 3.6 million miles and a little over nine days, they would come to a wheel stop and Terry gives them the call. Smooth landing for the space shuttle Endeavour. Astronaut David Wolf is back home. A live picture of the Space Shuttle Endeavour, perhaps still cooling off from its return trip from space with seven astronauts on board. It landed just before sunset at the Kennedy Space Center, and John Holloman watched it. John? I'll tell you, Gene, it was a beautiful landing. It's finally over for astronaut Dave Wolf. He's been gone from planet Earth for four and a half months. Now he's flat on his back on a stretcher, probably in that astronaut carrier, the thing that looks kind of like a people mover to the right of the shuttle on your screen right now above the words center and Florida. Um, it was very important for doctors to keep him from standing up upon returning to gravity. For the other six members of his crew, it was an intense 10 days in space filled with cargo transfers from one spaceship to the other. In all, this crew moved 7,000 pounds of stuff, much of it going to Mir. Dave Wolf's mom, Dottie, was at the landing strip as Endeavour came back, along with about 30 friends and family members of Dr. Wolf. Mrs. Wolf said she couldn't bring his favorite food with her because sweet potato casserole doesn't travel well on an airliner. Too bad.
for Wolf, it's going to be a few hours of intense medical testing. And for the rest of the crew, a quick medical checkup before Thank party you. time with friends and family at a nearby motel. Dave Wolf is getting a custom-made pizza with a chef commissioned by NASA Administrator Daniel Golden because he said that was one of three things that he wanted as soon as he got back to work. He said he had to have a pizza. He mentioned a beverage, which I happen to know from experience with Dave Wolf, is a beer and a date. And his girlfriend is at the landing strip with his mom. We'll see what happens there. Gene? <laughs> Thank you, John. The American Raumfähre Endeavour is from its mission to the Raumstation Mir back. On Saturday at 23.35 Uhr, she landed happily in the Kennedy Raumfahrt Center in Florida. Under the return is also the astronaut Dave Wolf. After four months on the Raumstation Mir, he is for the first time again on the Earth. A new Soyuz capsule brought a new crew to the Mir. Damit befindet sich jetzt neben vier Russen und einem Amerikaner auch ein französischer Astronaut an Bord. The weather was good and the timing on the mark. The Space Shuttle Endeavour and its seven-member crew landed about 90 minutes ago. The shuttle glided silently down to Earth just before sunset, right on schedule. CNN's John Holloman is more on the shuttle mission. Three, two, one. We have booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavour, continuing the union of U.S. and Russian space endeavors. The night launch sent Endeavour up the U.S. east coast toward a rendezvous two days later with Russia's Mir space station. For astronaut Dave Wolf, it was the first chance in four and a half months to touch people who speak English. And he was obviously delighted to hand over the space station to his replacement, Andy Thomas. Andy and I are very busy working together. There's a lot of equipment here to learn how to work. Uh, we've had training on the ground, but of course it's a little different in uh, actual use. Uh, but there's a lot of hints on how to live and how to be efficient and how to keep track of your items and, uh, in fact, how to keep out of each other's way and, and help each other. And I've learned a lot about how these cosmonauts like to live, and I'm trying to pass that knowledge on to Andy. Thomas had some problems getting settled on Mir. His spacesuit to be used in an emergency evacuation didn't fit. When he reported this, Russian ground controllers accused him of being capricious. He responded in a CNN interview. No, I'm here to stay. Uh, no, the suit problem was real. I mean, I couldn't get it on. I tried with uh, Anatoly, the commander here, several times to get it on, and it, it was just impossible until we uh, made the adjustments, and then it went on fine. Uh, no, I'm prepared to uh, undertake this mission now, and. Uh, I'm looking forward to setting up a, a home in the Perota module and uh, uh, getting some personal things out and making it livable and uh, starting the adventure. With the spacesuit fixed and all his supplies loaded on Mir, Thomas settled down for a four and a half month stay. He says he'll polish his Russian language skills and help keep the 12 year old space station flying. As Endeavour pulled away from Mir, the eyes of the 10 Americans and Russians on the two ships were all at windows for the beautiful picture show that you can only see from space. United States Space Shuttle Endeavour is back at home base. It touched down Saturday at Florida's Kennedy Space Center. The shuttle ferried home astronaut David Wolf, who showed his enthusiasm, undaunted by four months on Russia's Mir space station. I don't have the fitting words. It's just such an exciting program that we're together doing uh, now with Europe, Japan, Canada, Russia, of course. South America included and uh, I think that we should all be very proud uh, to have a wonderful space program we have two great spacefaring countries working together and, and we're really going to going to design the future uh, the quality of the future way of life uh, similar as the NASA of the past is largely responsible for our current quality of life and I think that we can all look forward to an exciting space program in the future and we're just getting started. We have a lot to show you. Wolf was replaced on Mir by fellow U.S. astronaut, the Australian-born Andrew Thomas, who was carried up by Endeavour last week.
Die amerikanische Raumfähre Endeavour ist wieder sicher in Florida gelandet. Die sieben Astronauten wurden diesmal besonders herzlich begrüßt, denn mit ihrer erfolgreichen Mission feierte Amerika auch gleichzeitig den 40. Jahrestag der US-Raumfahrt. 1958 nämlich war der erste Satellit der Amerikaner gestartet. Mehr von Erdmann Hummel. Nach elf Tagen Schwerelosigkeit taucht sie wieder auf, die amerikanische Raumfähre Endeavour. Hinter ihr liegen wissenschaftliche Experimente und eine vier Tonnen schwere Ersatzteillieferung für die Mir. Unter den sieben Astronauten ist auch David Wolf. Der konnte heute Morgen seine Freundin nach vier Monaten wieder in die Arme schließen. Er ist noch ein wenig schwach auf den Beinen. Die Schwerelosigkeit hat ihre Spuren hinterlassen. Ich fühle mich ganz gut, sagt Wolf, doch meinen Kopf muss ich noch vorsichtig bewegen. Wenn ich ihn zu kräftig drehe, fühlt es sich so an, als wenn mein Körper gleich hinterherfliegt und alles dreht sich um mich. Begeisterung auch im 13.000 Kilometer entfernten Moskau. Hier sprang Madame Ea von ihrem Sitz auf und freute sich für ihren Mann auf der Mir. Mit der Soyuz-Kapsel war der Franzose Stunden vorher an die russische Raumstation angedockt. Anatoli Solovyov und Pavel Vinogradov freuen sich besonders, denn sie werden jetzt nach einem halben Jahr abgelöst. Der Franzose Leopold Ea will in den kommenden drei Wochen die Entwicklung von Wirbeltieren in der Schwerelosigkeit erforschen. Dazu hat er sechs Salamander mitgebracht, die im Weltraum Eier legen sollen. Der Kasare Talgat Musabayev und der Russe Nikolai Budarin werden die nächsten vier Monate mit dem Amerikaner Andy Thomas auskommen müssen. Der war kurzfristig für den Flug ausgesucht worden, spricht aber nur ein paar Brocken Russisch. Doch die Besatzung ist sich sicher, wenn Thomas wieder heimfliegt, kann er es perfekt. Klarer Himmel, exakte Landung. Nach einem Besuch bei der russischen Raumstation Mir setzte die US-Raumfähre Endeavour wieder sicher auf dem Kennedy-Raumflughafen in Florida auf. An Bord ein russischer Kosmonaut und sechs US-Astronauten, darunter David Wolf, der nach 119 Tagen im All endlich seine Freundin wieder umarmen durfte. Der Start der europäischen Rakete Ariane musste unterdessen erneut verschoben werden, voraussichtlich auf morgen. Nach einer mehrtägigen Mission im All ist die US-Raumfähre sicher in Cape Canaveral gelandet. Fünf Tage lang war sie an die Raumstation Mir gekoppelt. An Bord befanden sich sieben Astronauten, unter ihnen auch der Amerikaner David Wolf. Er hat 119 Tage in der Raumstation verbracht und wurde jetzt von seinem Kollegen Andrew Thomas abgelöst. An Bord der Endeavour kam auch der US-Astronaut David Wolf zurück. Er hatte vier Monate in der russischen Raumstation Mir gearbeitet. Training in a simulator for a flight from Russia to the new International Space Station. A flight they plan to take for Rio a year from now. In this simulation, they've just been told the computers have shut down seconds before launch and they're trying to figure out what went wrong. I think the biggest thing is the difficulty of communication. Uh, Russian language is not easy uh, for me. Uh, but even beyond that, there's a technical level of understanding that's pretty deep and uh, that's been the hardest thing. Shepard is training to spend nearly six months in orbit on the new space station next year. He says most people don't realize the station is almost ready. But a series of agreements signed in Washington last week commit the world's spacefaring nations to complete the station. The first piece to be launched in June on a Russian proton rocket is on its way to the launch pad at Baikonur, Kazakhstan. And the second piece, a connecting tunnel built in Alabama, is being readied for launch at the Kennedy Space Center. Contractors in Russia and the U.S. have fallen behind on some of the later pieces of the station, but officials at the Krunichev rocket factory in Moscow say they believe the Russians will be able to catch up. In this case, uh, this is our mutual problem, and we have the same concern as everybody has. So, from Russia to the U.S., to Japan and Europe, the wheels are in motion to have the new space station up and running by this time next year. John Holloman, CNN Moscow. Die der Europäischen Raumfahrtorganisation ESA ist in der Nacht vom Raumfahrtzentrum Kourou in französisch Guiana erfolgreich gestartet. Nach etwa 20 Minuten setzte sie zwei Satelliten im All aus. Der eine soll der Kommunikation zwischen Schiffen und Flugzeugen dienen, der andere Fernsehbilder und Telefongespräche nach Lateinamerika übertragen. Der Start war in den vergangenen Tagen mehrmals wegen schlechten Wetters verschoben worden. Ребята, я вас слышу. Вы меня слышите? 
Это со станции QVC Нью-Йорк. We have a Russian interpreter here who is actually speaking live on, to, the, to the cosmos in the mirror. Плохо, как у меня слышите? Я вас слышу хорошо. Могли бы вы сейчас написать QVC? Having a couple of technical problems. What I want to show you is the pen works. There you go. There you go. You see what I'm talking about? <laughs> that is great. What you might call a really far out bargain. And God bless America. America doesn't hear much from this man anymore, but can still catch a glimpse of him every now and then. You see, Ronald Reagan still goes to his office most days. This visit took place about a year ago. His workspace is not quite the Oval Office, but one thing hasn't changed. He still loves golf and plays most weekends. He has his routine, and routine, says Maureen Reagan, is important to her father, who has Alzheimer's disease. Asked if he still enjoyed life, Maureen Reagan said, he enjoys today. And today, his world is a little smaller. The ranch he loved is up for sale. Home is a house in Bel Air. Happy New Year! But the former president still keeps outside contacts, still talks with his pastor on a regular basis, though he has not done this, actually go to church, in about a year. Still, people close to him say the man once called the great communicator still enjoys meeting people. Of course, when he was president, most meetings were with the greats. Well, America. Back then, meetings were for people like Mother Teresa. Today's encounters are much more likely to be with folks like these, tourists he met on a walk, or with children. He met with these kids at his office. He's met with others at the presidential library. It is one place where they can still hear from Ronald Reagan. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. And sometimes, every now and then, if they're lucky, they may even catch a glimpse of him out enjoying his today. Anne McDermott, CNN, Los Angeles. Good afternoon from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This is Space Shuttle Endeavor Launch Control. The countdown for launch of Space Shuttle Endeavor tonight on Mission STS-89 is continuing on schedule. Launch is scheduled to occur at about 9.48 p.m. Eastern Time and we are currently at a scheduled hold at T minus three hours. Work at launch pad 39A as well as operations here in the firing room are continuing as planned. This is Endeavour's first mission to dock with Russia's space station Mir. The previous seven docking missions were all successfully done with the orbiter Atlantis. With an on-time launch, docking of Endeavour with Mir is set to occur at about 3 p.m. Eastern time on Saturday, January 24th. And we're with live pictures now from the crew quarters and the operations checkout building as our seven astronauts are seated for their uh, traditional meal uh, prior to launch. Our Sheripov is a uh, mission specialist, um, as well as we just saw mission specialist James Riley. Here is uh, Vani Dunbar, who is preparing for her fifth flight into space today. She is uh, the most experienced astronaut of all the uh, crew members today which are commanded by Terry Wilcott, who will be leading this crew of seven. Uh, Andy Thomas will be remaining on Mir for four months. Michael Anderson and pilot Joe Edwards are preparing for their first flights into space today. Everybody looks like they're wide awake. They have been, in fact, awake since about nine o'clock this morning. Uh, they've had two meals since that time, and uh, this is uh, simply a snack that they will have before they uh, make final preparations to board the Orbiter Endeavour and then launch tonight at our preferred launch time of 9.48 p.m. At the shuttle pad, the final inspection team is uh, continu are continuing their operations to make final inspections of the Orbiter as well as to look for uh, any potential debris items that may be on the pad surface or on any of the number of walkways that go run up and down the full length of the vehicle. They'll also be looking for any buildups of ice uh, or frost on the external tank following the loading of the cryogenic reactants. And we have 
now move to live TV of our astronauts that are being suited up. Uh, they have just completed their weather briefing and are making an effort to uh, get a little bit ahead of schedule, so they have uh, moved on into the suit-up room. Uh, Commander Terry Wilka, of course, being the uh, commander of this mission, is uh, did again receive his weather briefing just moments ago and uh, was told that uh, we will proceed with our activities tonight, that there are no technical issues that we're dealing with. Bonnie Dunbar, who is preparing to make her fifth flight into space tonight, is also uh, making final preparations to ensure that her suit is tight and snug. Joe Edwards, of course, seen. Uh, he is the pilot of this crew, and he is preparing for his first flight into space. And we have seated here uh, Michael Anderson, again, also making his first flight into space. Jim Riley, also making his first flight into space. He is uh, designated mission specialist number one. And he is uh, saying hello to his uh, friends and family who may be watching or who have actually come to the Space Center to watch his launch tonight. Uh, Salazan uh, Sharapov is a graduate from the Moscow State University. Uh, he was also a pilot instructor in the Russian Air Force, and he was been training at the Gagarian Cosmonaut Training Center to be an astronaut or a cosmonaut candidate uh, since 1990. Andy Thomas will be uh, making his second trip aboard the shuttle, but this will be his first time to visit the space station Mir, uh, which will be his home for the next four months. Uh, he will replace astronaut Dave Wolf, who has been on Mir since September. Uh, Thomas is uh, scheduled to be the seventh and final astronaut to live aboard Mir. And at this time, we do have live shots from the third floor of the operations and checkout building as the crew exit their crew quarters and make their way down the hallway toward the elevator, which will take them out to the astronaut van, which will then take them out to the pad. And they're being greeted by well-wishers and supporters, uh, employees at the Kennedy Space Center who like to get a last glimpse of the crew before they head off into space, spending the next nine days in orbit. Five of those days, docked with the Mir space station. And the astronauts coming out of the quarters right now as they are being led by their commander, Terry Wilcutt, followed by pilot Joe Edwards, mission specialist Bonnie Dunbar, Michael Anderson, Salazan Sharpov, James Riley, and Andy Thomas. And this is a view from the White Room as our commander, uh, Terry Wilcutt, uh, is making uh, final preparations to enter the orbiter. He, is, he will be the first to enter the vehicle so that he, be, he can begin the uh, enormous task of making sure that uh, everything is set up and ready to go for a launch tonight. Mission Specialist Andy Tom Thomas uh, making his second trip uh, on board the shuttle. Again, he will remain on Mir for the next four months, replacing astronaut Dave Wolf, who has been on board Mir since September. Thomas will become the seventh and final astronaut to live aboard Mir. Pilot Joe Edwards has uh, just now uh, crawled into the orbiter, and he will be followed by mission specialist Bonnie Dunbar, 
uh, the most experienced astronaut in this flight, having gone into space four times already. I'll give you step 544. Okay, I'll put 545 in work. RSRT, OTC. RSRT. Step 554, new tape. Copy, that's complete. Tech 1390. 1390. And that was step 554? 554. Copy. OTC, PLT, time check. PLT, this is OTC. I got you loud and clear. How many? Roger, Roberta, good evening. Good evening, Joe. CACD, CGSF, and ABSX sent to the air to ground one. Verify active on air to ground one and monitor two three two for remainder of count and verify loud and clear. CACD, HCD verify loud and clear. All right, CGSF. CGSF, verify loud and clear. And JBSX. JBSX, CG loud and clear. Loud and clear also. Uh, Dave King is being introduced today as the uh, new launch director at Kennedy Space Center. He is only the third launch director the Cape has had since uh, we had returned to flight and, uh, of the space shuttle. Uh, King began his career with NASA in 1983 as a main propulsion engineer. He later served as flow director for the Orbiter Discovery and as the acting deputy director of the Installation Operations Directorate. And CDR launch director. Go ahead, sir, CDR. Okay, Terry, looks like uh, weather's good. Uh, looks like we got a good vehicle, and we're going to try to get you out of town tonight and uh, be looking forward to seeing you back here in uh, nine or ten days. Cool. Well, thanks a million, and uh, we'd also like to extend our thanks to uh, your workforce here at KSC and to all the honorees that are down here uh, for the Space Flight Awareness Launch. And we have orbiter access arm now being retracted away from the vehicle. Uh, this uh, arm can be returned to position within seconds if need be. OTC, PLT, AP restart is complete with three gray dot matches. OTC, PLT, AP starts complete with three good APs. Thank you. And final error surface checks of the orbiter's alevons as well as the rudder are being completed at this time. And this verifies the orbiter's hydraulic systems. And the three main engines are being gimbaled for a final test before launch. And we're standing by for the retraction of the gaseous oxygen vent hood away from the external tank, and it is being retracted at this time. Inside the bronze-colored tank is about 500,000 gallons of super-cold liquid fuels that run on the orbiter's three main engines. Copy that. Flight crew, OTC, close and lock your visors and initiate O2 flow. We begin 98, sending our last astronaut for his stay on Mir. We're going to howl for the Wolfman. Uh, that's it, work. We'll see it in a few days. 15. T-minus 13 seconds. 10. 9. 8. 7. 6. We have a go. Start. 4. 3. 2. 1. We have booster ignition. We have booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavor, continuing the union of U.S. and Russian space endeavors. Endeavor roll program. Roger, roll Endeavor. Houston is now controlling. The roll maneuver is complete. Endeavor is now in a heads down, wings level position, headed to a rendezvous with the Mir space station. Thirty seconds into flight, Endeavor now traveling at about 520 miles per hour. Endeavour's engines are now throttling down to 67% of rated thrust. Endeavour is now passing through the area of maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle in the lower atmosphere, downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 2.3 miles, traveling at a speed of just about 870 miles per hour. And 
Endeavour Houston, go with throttle up. Roger, go with throttle up. One minute, 19 seconds into the flight. Endeavour's three liquid-fueled engines are now back at full throttle, 104% of rated thrust. Endeavour downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, a distance of about 10 and a half miles, traveling at the speed of about 2,000 miles per hour. Just about seven minutes of powered flight remaining. Two minutes, nine seconds into the flight, the booster officer confirms good separation of the solid rocket boosters. Endeavour now downrange from the Kennedy Space Center at a distance of about 38 miles. Houston, performance nominal. Copy, performance nominal. Endeavour Houston, two-engine tau. Copy, Susan, two-engine tau. Two minutes, 35 seconds into the flight, Endeavour's performance has been as expected, and in the event of a single engine failure, Endeavour could now reach the transatlantic landing site at Zaragoza, Spain. Telemetry still continuing to indicate that all three main engines and auxiliary power units and fuel cells are performing well.
Commander Terry Wilkett continuing to fly a very precise course up toward the Mir space station and uh, this view from the Mir space station looking at Endeavour as it continues its approach toward the Mir now at a distance of just about 45 feet. And this view of the uh, crew cabin of Endeavour from its overhead windows. Houston, we're with you, Tidra Z, and via Mir, we're looking in through your two overhead windows. And these are the overhead windows in the crew cabin of Endeavour as it is now just about 43 feet away from Mir. Uh, this view coming from the Mir space station. As Endeavour approaches the 30-foot distance from the Mir space station, uh, this view of the overhead windows in the crew cabin of Endeavour. Very shortly, the crew will begin its station keeping at the 30-foot level before receiving their final go decision to proceed for at the docking with Mir. That docking expected just about 11 minutes from now. The docking will take place in darkness, as this view also is in orbital night. As the two spacecraft now are some 209 nautical miles, or 240 statute miles, high over the African continent. We copy your The crew is reporting that they have sighted the docking target on board Mir and that uh, no course correction is required at this time. crew is now beginning its final approach to the Mir, passing inside the 30-foot mark as it continues a very slow approach for docking with the Mir space station. Endeavour now within 25 feet, closing at a rate of about one-tenth of a foot per second. And contact between Endeavour and the Mir space station confirmed on time at 2.14 p.m. Central Time. Endeavour Houston for Andy, we have a good view of the flight deck. What's it look like? Once Commander Anatoly Soloviev is uh, done with his activities opening up the Mir hatch, 
as well as some housekeeping activities at the conclusion of that. The shuttle will begin a pressurization equalization prior to the opening of the door from the, or the hatch from the shuttle side, allowing the Mir 24 and STS-89 crews to greet each other personally. Terry, we have an excellent view of you at the ODS hatch, and you have a go for hatch opening. This is Mission Control Houston. Hatch opening and a first greeting between Mir-24 Commander Anatoly Soloviev and Mir STS-89 Commander Terry Wilcott. As Endeavour Mir are passing just to the southeast of Australia. Greetings all around. Reminder to push and hold the uh, bips move.
looks like we're getting down to the end of things here. Pretty, I mean, we've got to take out the MGBX tonight yet and, and change over this uh, tissue culture equipment. But I think we're pretty much closing out most of our items. Uh, we've got a few hard ones yet that we're waiting on, but uh, they're little items that I think we can come home without. That's how I see it right now. Glad to hear it, Dave. I know you've had a, uh, a very busy four months, and I know that the guys who brought Endeavor up to you have had an extremely busy four days, so uh, we'd be happy to have the pace slacken off just a little. Very good. I tell you, the team's clicking real nice up here, and uh, it's just a pleasure being with uh, my American friends again, and uh, th this whole thing's just a wonderful experience. I can't wait to see you on the ground, and and uh, maybe you'll get, drag me through the ski course a time or two. This is Mission Control Houston, and this view once again of the double space hab module in Endeavour's payload bay in the aft section of the space hab module is Mission Specialist Bonnie Dunbar, and in the foreground, Mission Specialist Jim Riley, and with his back to the camera, uh, Dave Wolf, who has just completed his 119-day stay as a member of a mere crew. The astronauts have just completed stowing away one of the experiments that was conducted during Wolf's tenure on the Mir space station for its return trip back to Earth and have been conversing over the past several minutes with the scientific community here in Houston to ensure that the stowage was accomplished properly and provide the status of that stowage down to the payload community here in Houston. We've completed step three. We're closing the hatch. Endeavor. Helen, the standoff cross is installed and the hatch is closed. We don't 
Виталик придет да. на время открывать. Да, понятно. Ну, в принципе, как и мы в прошлый раз, вот, в сентябре работали, это или когда в августе мы, да, постыковали его. Ну, хочешь или не хочешь, там в аспираторах надо работать. Да, я думаю, что так ты придешь взять. На коротко найти кабель состыковать, лег прикрыть и. Я понял, Владимир. Да и решение еще не принято, так что мы еще будем обсуждать. Так, а на корабле там 3 3 прошла, там раскрылась, все нормально, да? Да, ребят, все. Так, а что ты на руке, ты вроде грамка маленькая такая. Такая? Ну, она отличная. А, вот, сразу, сразу. А -а -а. Ссылки на документацию. Houston Endeavor, physical separation, executing SEPBAR. Anatoly Kruki at Kriti. Houston Endeavor's crew confirming physical separation of Endeavor from the Mir space station. Земли закладываем 
С-02, 2036-16, единицу. Так, сейчас подскажем. Эту закладку вычеркиваем, да. Отбой подготовки у нас прошел. Это мы не делаем. Рядом. Он должен быть рядом с усилителем. Посмотрите, не, посмотрите внимательно, он должен быть где-то рядышком. Расходимся уже, да, Паша? Видно хорошо.
Сейчас вот сейчас, да, сейчас есть. Сейчас есть. На фоне солнечной батареи висит. Анатолий. Да. Ну вот запрашивали вы по поводу э, этого переноса закрытия люков вправо. Я вот боюсь, что не получится у нас это дело, потому что мы привязаны к телеметрии. У нас дальше уже пустые зоны. У нас телеметрия. Endeavour Houston, we're on the flight deck. Okay, welcome. I'm going to go ahead and start our tape. Uh, what this is, is a little tour that we took from Space Hab down the tunnel uh, to the mid-deck and the flight deck. And I'll introduce it by saying that, you know, we're on the day before landing, so there's a lot of activity as we prepare to uh, stow our hardware and finish up our experiment op. And I hope that what you'll see is the environment uh, that we've uh, been working in and uh, get a feel for what it's like. This is not Cecil D. DeMille. This is uh, our eyeball view of uh, living in zero gravity. So stand by. We're going uh, into the hab right now from the tunnel, which runs from the mid-deck to the space hab. It's floating right in front of my eye, so you're seeing what we see as we come in. We're looking uh, towards the tail of the shuttle. That uh, large white package you see in the center is actually an empty foam cushion that uh, contains some of our transfer cargo. We're now scanning to the starboard side and now to the forward side. You can see uh, the tunnel we just came through and the Space Hab subsystem computer that uh, we set up every day. We have our cue cards up, uh, a handheld mic there velcroed, and then over to the starboard side you see Many of the soft uh, containers that were used for our cargo that worked out very well. Now going back towards the aft end, you see the OPM rack. The OPM is uh, safely secured within it. And the cushion that's uh, gently tethered to the front. So now let's go back to the aft end. Uh, we just missed Jim. We'll see him again a little bit later. He was working on MGM, which is in the center there. You'll see it in a moment. Right in front of you are the two SAM sensor heads. Those are acceleration measuring systems. And up there, the blue box is the EOF freezer. And now the two CGBAs that uh, Dave tended to during his flight and that we transferred during the flight. Those are part of our status check every day. And surrounding them are more of the uh, transfer containers, the cargo containers. We get a look, closer look at the SAMS here. Uh, it's flown many flights. Uh, comes out of the Lewis Research Center. It's an excellent acceleration uh, measurement system. These remote heads can be put anywhere to measure in different frequency ranges the uh, AC accelerations that experiments are exposed to. There are two chambers to the SAMs. Uh, I'm not showing you the active one right now. This is uh, one of the cell test cells. And up on the ceiling there is part of the Japanese experiment for radiation monitoring. It's called the detector unit, strapped to the ceiling with a silver dosimeter strapped around it. Another advantage of a weightless environment is that you can use all surfaces. And off to your right there on the starboard side of the space hab, is the um, DTO-1125, or TIPIC experiment, out of the Johnson Space Center, with its uh, dosimeter balls uh, strapped in various places. Now if we scan to the port side, we see a large rack that is a combination of two experiments, the uh, VRAFE and the Japanese uh, Radiation Monitoring Experiment. We've been doing quite a lot of work with the RRMD. It has a, an electrical panel there up at the top, and then a data recording unit next to the computer. And that's the RRMD laptop that we have set up for keeping track of data. Now we're going back down the tunnel, and we're going to pass through the ODS, or the orbiter docking system, which is also now our external airlock. Those yellow handrails on your 
your left and right are what I'm using to kind of float myself down the tunnel. I'm going to come in under the EMUs in the external airlock, and we're going to just look up and take a look at uh, what we were calling MS-7 and MS-8 on our mid-deck for quite a few days. Now we're going into uh, a tunnel adapter, which is where we keep uh, several bags of stowage uh, during the mission. Here we keep our laundry bags and uh, flight data file that we're not using. Now the mid-deck is not only a laboratory, it's also our living area. Mike's been working on a lot of our mid-deck experiments. Here he's setting up a camera operation uh, for MTNE. As you know, we've been working uh, some anomalies with that, and we're trying to understand uh, what's happening in that uh, experiment. Just above that is the sea bass experiment, and certainly while you can't see uh, the fish, the big ones or the little ones or the snails, we've been peering through the screens because it's back backlit back there and find it very interesting. The commander is working out on the bicycle, and we'll all get our turn today. And you can see that we have quite a bit of stowage that uh, we've been moving around on the mid-deck. These two laptops uh, represent what's happening on the GPS experiment, DTO 700-14 and DTO 700-15, which we call SIGI. Now we scan uh, to our port side uh, to the MAR area, the galley area, and the WCS area. And our prime payload just needed to have something to do, so we put him to work, and he's turned out to be very good at this. This is a check of the refrigerator, the TEHM, and one of the things we noticed is that uh, we have to keep the filter clean, and so we just cleaned the filter for those folks. We had a small pallet that had been sucked in. We also have activity up on the flight deck, so we'll just float up there. where Jim uh, has uh, quite a few cameras arrayed. And every time we all get a chance, we come up and take some photos uh, for the Earth Ops folks. These are 70 millimeter Hasselblads. And this is the EarthCam camera set up in the starboard window. The view of the uh, front cockpit, uh, that is the flight plan that's tethered and floating in front of you. And the OCA PGSC, which now has the EarthCam software, is uh, sitting up on our port uh, panel. So let's go back down the uh, inner access deck area. We'll go down head first this time. And we'll say uh, goodbye to the commander, Terry Wilcott, who's just done a superb job with this flight. And I'll say goodbye as well, and thank you again for all the support that we got from the ground. Endeavor now on final approach to runway 15. Endeavor Houston on glide slope on center line. Thank you, Susan. We have the field sign. Roger. Runway in sight. Endeavor is descending at a angle six times steeper than that of a commercial airliner on its final approach. Al altitude now, 3,400 3, feet. Time to touch down, 40 seconds. Landing gear coming down. Landing gear down and locked. Main gear touchdown. The drag chute now being deployed. Nose wheel touchdown. 
Denver now rolling out on with 1-5 at Kennedy Space Center at the end of a nine-day, 3.6 million mile journey, bringing home astronaut Dave Wolf from his four-month stay in space. Welcome back from 128 days on orbit. 